Good day, brothers and sisters. This is the other Paul, and we have another special live stream interview today. I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Nemish. My man, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Very well. I'm very well myself. Had uh, as as I mentioned before, a very nice party yesterday. So I'm nice and uh, nice and happy this morning. Very happy to get along, get moving with what we're happening today. Now, what does that mean? What we're happening today? <laughs> What did I say? Why do I just say random crap? <laughs> but <laughs> we're going on with a very good and very spicy topic today. The first of two parts. Uh, today is more or less going to be first principles and how things ought to be addressed with respect to the church fathers, how Protestants should approach the church fathers, how they should read them. And then the second part tomorrow is going to be more direct engagement with the other traditions and their objections that they'll give to us Protestants, particularly of the more low church kind, since some objections may of that we will address tomorrow may be given by, say, Lutherans and Anglicans. But uh, today, to get us uh, started right off the bat, Dr. Nemesh, could you please uh, just describe yourself, your work, um, what, how, how you ended up getting into the whole Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant dialogue in that? And uh, yeah, give us all that background so people can know what they're about to get into. Sure. Um, so my name is Stephen Nemesh. I have a PhD in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, where I studied with professors Oliver Crisp and Veli Mati Karkainen. Uh, my dissertation was titled A Constructive Theological Phenomenology of Scripture. Effectively, what I was doing is I was proposing a uh, rigorous phenomenological analysis of the act of reading the Bible as scripture for the sake of making a constructive theological proposal about the nature and interrelations of scripture, tradition, and church as sources and authorities for theology. So this is basically like, uh, you know, one of the central problems of theological method, the relationship between scripture and ecclesial tradition. Uh, and I approach this question from the point of view of phenomenological research or phenomenological investigation into what it is to read the Bible as scripture. Um, uh, my dissertation was passed with distinction. The, um, so uh, professors Crisp and Karkainen read the dissertation. And also there was an external reader who was John Baer. I'm sure that you've heard of John Baer. Uh, he was the external reader for my dissertation and he really liked it a lot. He gave it a very glowing review. So that that's always gonna be a point of pride for me that John Baer liked my dissertation. Um, you know, even if uh, even if I argue for things that maybe he might find objectionable as an Orthodox theologian, or perhaps he might not, because in my in my dissertation I was arguing that there is no infallibility in theology, um, and I was arguing for a a reorientation of um, the understanding of the church and of what it means to be a Christian away from a doctrinal conception and uh, more on. Um, uh, more focused around what I call believing in Jesus, as opposed to believing that this or that is the case. So I distinguish between believing that and believing in, and I say that really we should think about what it means to be the church and what it means to be a Christian in terms of believing in rather than in terms of believing that. Uh, so that's something that I, I talk about in my dissertation. Um, I'm going, to, I have written a lot on this topic. I've got a few papers that I published this year. Uh, one of them is basically uh, one of the chapters of my dissertation. The paper is called Theology Without Anathemas, and it was published in Journal of Analytic Theology this past year. I have another paper called Against Infallibility, uh, in which I tried to continue the argument from that first paper. Uh, so what I'm doing in that first paper is arguing that there is no infallibility in theology. Uh, in this second paper, Against Infallibility, I'm taking that argument and addressing it even further, uh, addressing various questions responses that you might have. So the first the first argument was really sort of philosophical. Mm -hmm. The second one, I enter more into biblical or church historical reasons that people might propose for accepting the possibility of infallibility in theology. And so I try to develop the argument further along. Um, I am currently working on a volume which will be published in the Cambridge Elements series called Orthodoxy and Heresy in Christian Theology. Uh, and basically what I'm trying to do in that volume is to present the notions of orthodoxy and heresy as they function in theology and the so-called Catholic tradition, uh, Catholic with a small c. Um, I talk a little bit about how the Bible presents certain ideas as orthodox or as heretical, although it doesn't always use exactly those terms. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about the developments and the evolution of the Catholic tradition uh, over time, uh, talking about, for example, the question about Gnosticism and the true apostolic shape of Christianity with Irenaeus, 
or the you know Christological Trinitarian debates of the fourth century, uh, the debates about the use of images in the eighth and eighth century, I guess, and then the debates about the real presence in the beginning, uh, sort of the Middle Ages. So I go over a, a historical overview of the evolutions and the developments of orthodoxy and heresy as these are understood in the Catholic tradition. Uh, I talk about the relationship between scripture and ecclesial tradition, which is one of the things I, I focused on in my dissertation. Uh, how do these relate to each other? Of course, this is a point where Protestants and Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox will differ with each other. Protestants tend to emphasize the priority of scripture as a, an authority for, for uh, theology. Um, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics will tend to emphasize the priority of tradition. Uh, as a guide for interpreting scripture and so on. Mm. So I talk a little bit about that. And then finally, the last chapter of this introductory volume, I'm going to be uh, arguing against the Catholic tradition and its conception of how to do theology in favor of my own approach, which is, I, I call theology without anathemas. Um, now, why, why theology without anathemas? Because uh, the anathema is connected to the notions of orthodoxy and heresy. Uh, an anathema is the means by which an orthodox party, or at least the party that takes itself to be orthodox, uh, separates itself, purifies itself of opinions that, um, you know, it deems to be heretical. So the anathema basically is how the orthodox, uh, is how orthodoxy uh, uh, directs itself or, you know, interacts with heresy. Orthodoxy anathematizes heresy. That's the thing. Hmm. Now, the argument that I give in my in this chapter, and this is something I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about today and tomorrow, is that orthodoxy and heresy are basically ways of denoting relations between ideas, uh, hmm. whereas truth, uh, if you follow the definition of Aristotle, is the relationship between an idea and the thing of which it is an idea. Aristotle says that. Uh, Truth is saying of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, truth occurs when you describe a thing accurately, when you describe a thing as it is. Uh, but to call an idea orthodox or heretical is to describe its relation to another set of ideas that you take for granted. An mm -hmm. idea is only orthodox or heretical in comparison to other ideas. So basically, what I'm arguing in that uh, chapter is that the notions of orthodoxy and heresy are really should be unimportant for theology, which should only be concerned about the truth of what it says. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not the first one to argue this, Wolfhard Pannenberg. Uh, so Pannenberg argues in the first chapter of the first volume of a systematic theology that theology should have a concern for the truth of what it says. Um, and he basically turns theology into a kind of a science that tries to propose a theory that can make sense of all the data and so on. Um, I'm sort of doing the same thing, but maybe with different language or with a different mm. philosophical background. But I'm arguing for basically what I took Pannenberg to be arguing for, namely mm. that uh, theology should be concerned with the truth of what it says. Um, and then my contribution to this is to say that mm. because it's concerned with truth and truth is a relation between an idea and a thing, it mm. should not be concerned with the orthodoxy or heresy of its ideas. It should mm. only be concerned to speak truthfully. Mm. Um, so that's what I'm going to be arguing in that book. Um, I also have a manuscript for a book on the Eucharist that I've completed, and I've been presenting my research on my YouTube channel from that book. It's currently under review, so I'm hoping that it will be published. If it does, mm -hmm. it'll be published with Cambridge University Press, which I think would be very nice. Uh, but we'll see. I should find out about mid-March or so if, if the reviewers think it's worth publishing. Um, so that's a little bit about what I am and or who I am oh, and what I bit. do. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you asked the question, why did I get into this topic of the debates between Protestantism and Catholicism? Well, the reason is the following. Um, I, cons I was very much preoccupied with the question of whether or not I should become Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic for a long time, for about 10 plus years. I was constantly thinking about the question. Sometimes I got closer to pulling the trigger than others. Um, but basically what happened is that about during my PhD and just as I was about to begin writing my dissertation, um, various life events took place and I read a book called The Meaning of Protestant Theology by Philip Carey. And, uh, Carey's argument sort of solidified in my mind that I'm a Protestant, that I'm not a Roman Catholic. Um, I... And then this, together with my investigations in phenomenology and my understanding sort of the consequences of that philosophical method, uh, led me to think, no, there is something epistemically very wrong. There's, there's something wrong with the way that Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy does theology. Yeah. Uh, so 
that was happening with me. Now, on the other hand, I see a bunch of people, you know, former Protestants who uh, sort of get, you know, swept up in converting to Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, and it's like they're taken by a wave. Yeah. Uh, and I saw this, and this was disturbing to me because I think that, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a Roman Catholic or being an Eastern, Orth Eastern Orthodox, but I don't think that you, anyone has to be one. I, I don't think that there is any necessity for a person to be either Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. And I think also a lot of times people are converting to Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy for reasons that are specious and that don't actually survive mm -hmm. uh, close examination. Mm -hmm. So the one of the reasons why I wanted to get into this debate and to offer my own contribution is to give people who are on the fence or who are thinking about these issues another perspective that they're not getting anywhere else. I noticed that there are very few really catchy and popular resources um, available for Protestants interested in these questions. Roman Catholics mm -hmm. and Eastern Orthodox, on the other hand, do a really great job of, you know, issuing propaganda, I suppose. I mean that term neutrally, but you know, it, propaganda is what it is, just propagating their views on the internet and making it seem attractive. Uh, so I wanted to offer another perspective and I wanted to, uh, you know, let people who are considering these things hear someone who says, no, there's nothing wrong with being a Protestant. Actually, it's preferable if you're that you be a Protestant and you should remain one. You shouldn't worry about going to Roman Catholicism. So that's kind of why I got interested in this issue. I had been through that struggle myself, but mm. I came to realize, you know, later on that, no, this these these churches are not actually where I should be. I should be where I am. Uh, and so I wanted to offer my perspective to people who are interested in these questions and to give them also another point of view besides the one that they had been hearing online. Yeah. Okay. Very fascinating stuff. I, I've, I've always, I've always had a little bit of an eyebrow raise when you talk about how, cause I, I know what you mean. I'm, when you talk about how you want to dispatch of those categories of her heresy and orthodoxy, I'm charitable, of, charitable enough to know that you're not proposing an absolutely subjective Christianity where people just believe whatever the hell they want, but that these spe the specific ways in which those categories have been deployed is well, kind of countervailing to the truth at some points. Although I, I guess it's, it's still a little bit weird to me because the way I always use orthodoxy and heresy is more or less synonymous with truth. So if I see something, it's like, okay, that's not true according to scripture, according to God's word. Okay, that's heresy. This is true according to scripture. Okay, that's orthodoxy. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess with the way that the high church has used it, as you mentioned, with how orthodoxy and heresy more or less rely upon other ideas and all that. So they will, de they will deem something heretical because it violates this very specific philosophical categorization of for example, the two natures of Christ and all that stuff. So it can get into uh, get a lot into the weeds and all that. Um, really mm. briefly before we continue, because I know we're limited on time today. Really briefly, could you explain your uh, a little bit more broaden out your explanation of the difference between heresy and orthodoxy and truth? Because I know that some people could possibly still stumble on that. Sure. So uh, truth is a relation that obtains between an idea and a thing of which it is the idea. So if I think to myself, you know, there's a person in the other room. Uh, my thought is true if that's the way things are. There is someone there. Um, now, uh, orthodoxy and heresy don't uh, only have to do with um, uh, things. They have to do with other ideas, right? So an idea is orthodox if it coheres well with other ideas that are taken mm -hmm. for granted as orthodox. So I agree with you, and I don't want to give the false impression. I agree that in the Catholic tradition, the orthodoxy and truth are taken for granted as going together. Hmm. Um, where I'm going to object is that this sort of thing cannot be taken for granted, right? It's one thing for an idea to be orthodox, which means basically that the community accepts it. Hmm. Um, and it's another thing for that idea to be true because it could be that the tr community's ideas are false. Um, hmm. And so when you actually ask the question, okay, are these orthodox ideas actually true? then you cannot just respond that they have to be true because they're orthodox. That's something else, right? That's circular. Mm -hmm. I want to know whether your purported orthodoxy is in fact true. And in order to do that, you cannot simply note its relation to other ideas. You have to compare what you say to the thing that you're talking about. So mm -hmm. if you say that this is an orthodox doctrine of, of Christ, well, I want to know, okay, is that actually true? Maybe this is what the community says that you should believe. Maybe this is what mm -hmm. some group of people have agreed upon, but is it true? Once you answer that question, is it true? All that other stuff about its relation to other ideas or its status within a community mm. doesn't matter anymore. It matters whether it's accurate to the thing itself. Mm. Uh, and so that's, for me, theology without anathemas is setting aside the question of orthodoxy and heresy uh, and concerning yourself strictly with um, whether or not what you're saying is true to the mm. thing that you're talking about. Yeah. 
Very fascinating. Very fascinating stuff. I've, I can so sympathize with those exact kind of thoughts, but you just articulate them like that, like absolutely perfectly where it's like, I can think of so many times where I see someone throw at me, Oh, the majority of scholars say X about, I, I don't know, let's say about, about evolution or the majority of scientists say this about climate change or the majority of scholars say this about gospel authorship. Or in this case, of course, the majority of church fathers say this about this doctrine. And every single time I always come to myself thinking, mate, I don't give a stuff what all your favorite people say about something. I care about what they can prove. Okay. If you mm -hmm. throw a thousand scholars or a thousand church fathers at me, they say one thing. And then I go to investigate that thing with proper principles of investigation, historical method and all that. And I come to another conclusion. Frankly, what other people say isn't really going to matter one, one little thing <laughs> yeah so it's so a uh, huge sympathy huge sympathy there and i think that more or less it, the way you articulate it is the way that you articulate it isn't really brought out that well by many protestants but it really is when you think about it, the core of what it is to be protestant where you would actually go to the thing to the sources themselves and come to a reasoned conclusion okay what does this say what is mm -hmm. god actually saying rather than what do these people say god is saying um, yeah and of course i guess that's getting the spice kicked off for us and uh, really, so with that, really briefly, um, when you mentioned your, really briefly before we get into the main meet, um, when you mentioned that you would have a bit of a wrestle with Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, what would you say is the closest, uh, the most the most compelling argument they'll bring to you that brought you closest, I'd say, to conversion? Well, basically, um, I was really, you know, uh, attracted to, the Eastern Orthodox ethos. You know, when I was an undergrad, I would carry around a copy of the sayings of the Desert Fathers with me and I would read it on my way from one class to the other. Um, you know, later on, as I began studying theology uh, at the at the master's and at the at the doctoral level, I was really concerned with questions of theological method. I was thinking, OK, we have rampant Christian disagreement. We have disagreements about all kinds of things. Uh, people not only disagree with each other, but they'll send each other to hell. They'll say that for, you know, for holding this opinion, you are going against God's word. Uh, and so I asked the question, okay, how, how can you know that? How can you be so sure that, um, that you are actually on God's side about this? How do you know that you're not the one who's wrong? Um, well, one thing that was attractive to me about Roman Catholicism is that it has a very structured answer to this question. It says, okay, we have... Uh, the living magisterium of the church, which can make pronouncements about matters of faith and morals and, uh, you know, questions that might come up for us and aspects, you know, uns you know, uh, problems of uncertainty can be resolved through the intervention of this mechanism, the, the living magisterium of the church. Hmm. Um, now, one thing that I realized over time was that as nice as this sounds, you know, as a theoretical uh, response to the problem of uncertainty and ambiguity and disagreement in theology, there is actually no reason to believe that there is an infallible magisterium. There is no reason to believe that the pronouncements that the, the magisterium makes are infallibly true or, you know, rather not just, you know, just elaborations of what those people already think and so on. Um, it's one thing, this is, this, is, this is where the Aristotelian definition of truth is really important for me. Uh, because Aristotle says, truth means saying, talking about a thing as that thing is. And falsity means talking about a thing as a thing is not. Now that implies that the thing is what it is independently of my talking about it, right? If I could not talk about, if the thing is only as I talk about it, then I could never be false. I could only ever be true. Uh, so the thing has to be what it is independently of whether I talk about it or think about it, independently of what anybody says or thinks about it. So there's an element of realism here. And I began to realize it's one thing to have a mechanism in place that will solve theoretical problems. And it's another thing for those solutions actually to be true, because mm -hmm. the solving of the theoretical problem, that, that, that just means, you know, the debate is put to an end uh, and some tension between ideas is resolved. But that's just about relations between ideas. That's just about what we talk about in our community. The real question, the more important question is whether it's true. And for that, it doesn't matter that you put an end to the debate. It matters that you're describing things as they are. Uh, so I began to see that there is this kind of confusion. People, um, people confuse, you know, authorized testimony with the things themselves. And because they don't have access or they don't imagine themselves to have access to the things themselves, they just take what authorized testifiers will uh, say about them, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes along and gives a bureaucratically final decision on some matter, that's, that's the same thing as determining the truth. Actually, it's not. 
right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the functioning of that bureaucratic mechanism is one thing and the truth of what it says is something else. It's true that the mechanism is in place to putting an end uh, for theological disputes because mm -hmm. You know, it just says this is the right answer. And if you disagree, you're out of the community. But that's not the same thing as saying something true. Uh, what truth, again, is speaking about a thing as it is. And that cannot be resolved by just having somebody come in and, and provide an answer. That For that, you need to turn to the thing itself, you know, to use the phenomenological model from Edmund Husserl. Uh, you have to turn to the thing itself. And that's, that's you know, do your best, uh, do the best you can uh, to describe the thing as as it seems to you. Mm. Yeah, lots of lots of very spicy takes there. Obviously, high churchians would uh, would come against that. I don't know why I just came up with that, but I guess that's that's kind of that's kind of my saying now. Although it's not really accurate because I guess like Lutherans and Anglicans to to a degree would probably agree with with much of this. But uh, with with Roman Catholics and Orthodox, obviously, <clears throat> we'd see that they would object on the idea that they're merely just going with what an authority says. They would obviously they would obviously say, well our institution standard by jesus christ guaranteed by the holy spirit to not preach error so we're making truth claims and all that and that's some stuff we'll definitely be getting into in particular in the second part but i think it will we'll definitely be touching on that in this in seeing what are truly best practices for reading the fathers themselves and so with that very very good segue into into this with how you mentioned that ultimately it's not a it's not a matter of just what what is what's what is this authority system or authority structure or person or whoever says to us but what do the sources that are in our discussion actually saying themselves and it's not obviously not just scripture that's being debated over but the fathers themselves so what do the fathers say about <clears throat> uh, about images about the uh, the seat of peter in rome about any number of topics and that's always what it always comes back to and is ultimately in every single conversion story of a Protestant to an Orthodox or Orthodoxy or Catholicism, without fail, every single time they'll mention that they read the Church Fathers, and oh look, now it's the it, they're clearly the Orthodox Church, or they're clearly the Roman Catholic Church, or the Oriental Orthodox, or the Armenian uh, or Oriental Orthodox, or the Church of the East, or a bunch of other <clears throat> denominations <clears throat> of the <laughs> High Church crowd. So, uh, <laughs> so that's that's probably a key thing. That's the key thing we want to really address in this. So to, to kick it off, and you kind of alluded to it already, um, how should Protestants view the Church Fathers to us? And do they have some degree of authority or epistemic privilege over us? And if so, how? Well, this is an interesting question because already when you call certain people Church Fathers, you are, you know, you're already committing yourself to them. You're already taking them as authorities in some way. You're, you're, planting yourself within their tradition, right? Because mm -hmm. you wouldn't call them fathers if you didn't agree with what they said, at least in large part, if not in every single point. So already when we talk about certain people as church fathers, we are taking for granted their perspective to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, now, should we do that? That's another question, right? I think we should agree with them if what they say is true. And if what they say is not true, then we should not agree with them. Um, and how can we know that? Well, by comparing what they say to the thing that they talk about. So the way that I think about these things is basically the church fathers, if you want to call them that, are dialogue partners. They are people who are talking about something. Uh, they were talking about the thing before I came along. That's that's for sure. Um, and a lot of times without my realizing it, the way that I talk about that thing is informed by the way they talked about it because people took their modes of speech, their modes of thinking, uh, they propagated them further on. And then here I stand at the long end of this chain of influence that traces back from them to where I am now in some way or other. Mm -hmm. So already without knowing it, I'm influenced by their particular ways of framing things, uh, by their uh, categories, by their understandings of things. Um, but what I should do, I think, as a as a theologian, I will say this, as a theologian, I think that what I should do is I should take them as dialogue partners. They are people who are engaged in research, they're talking about something, and I should see what they say, I should try to understand them and to get a good understanding of what they're saying, and compare it also to what they're talking about. Um, but I don't think that they are especially privileged. They are just people like the rest of us. They they do not, you know, the, the same things that make me incapable of knowing things or that, uh, you know, limit my ability to understand things properly, those limitations apply to them also. It's not as if they were superheroes. They are just ordinary human beings who belong to a particular religious tradition, and they talk about the things of those religious traditions to the best of their abilities. That doesn't mean that they're right about everything. Maybe they came across certain critical insights, which made them prominent for later generations. Uh, but 
again, that doesn't prove very much. There's always the question, are they actually right about those things? Or did they just manage to convince some people? And for that, I, I have to set aside the question of their authority and just compare what they say with what they're talking about. So that's, I, you know, I have a video on my YouTube channel called uh, Protestant uh, Theology and the Church Fathers or something like that. And basically what I argue there is that um, the Church Fathers are just partners in a dialogue. Now, this dialogue was taking place before I came along, so it's responsible of me to know what they were saying. And, yeah. you know, so it's important to know them as a theologian because you want to know how it is that you got here and what people were talking about before you showed up. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're right about everything. You know, you can always make corrections. Um, uh, you can always suggest, actually, they've misunderstood this idea here or, you know, here they were importing alien categories into the discussion of Scripture. And Scripture is not actually mm -hmm. talking about that. It's talking about something else. And so you can correct them. Um, I look at what Christ says in Matthew chapter 23 to his disciples, and he he's just about to begin a, a scathing polemic against the Pharisees. And he tells them, you are not to be called rabbis, uh, for you all have, you are not to be called instructors, for you all have one instructor, the Messiah, and you are all students. And you're not to call, you are not to be called father because you have only one father uh, who is in heaven and so on. Mm -hmm. So the metaphor that the image that Christ establishes there is that within his church, everybody's a student and he is the teacher. Now, I teach. I teach Latin in the 7th, 8th, and ninth grades. I know what it's like to run a classroom, okay? I have some students who are better and some students who are worse. I have some students who probably can do some tutoring in my place and some students with whom, you know, I cannot trust them to accurately tutor their peers. So if anything, the church fathers are more like tutors within a classroom. They're students who are particularly good and maybe they're sharp and they get things and they can explain things for other people, but they're not the teacher. And it's always possible that they've misunderstood something. And the ultimate reference point in the classroom is the teacher. Uh, so, so also, I think that's a, that, I think that would be the best metaphor for understanding the, uh, the church fathers in, in Christian theology. They're like tutors within the classroom of Christ who maybe are better than other students and they can explain things well, but they're still penultimate. The only ultimate authority, the only thing that really matters at the end of the day is Christ's teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And you cannot just take for granted that the tutors are necessarily right in everything. Even they can be corrected by the teacher. That's a really nice analogy and way to put it. And which I sympathize with a ton as a, well, as a high school teacher and training myself. And I've done a couple of teaching practicals already. And uh, actually slight, slight tangent, the last school I did something in is actually one of like the only schools I've seen like around me. They actually have a Latin, um, a Latin department. Um, and they recently won this like worldwide school Latin competition. It's really actually amazing to think about. Um, and same, same, same year groups as what you teach. Just fire, fascinating stuff. Anyway, tangent over <laughs> the teaching analogy, really, really good way to think of it. Um, <clears throat> cause that's, that's, that's hundred percent exactly as you say. And of course, Orthodox and Roman that would say that, well, the church is the body of Christ. So effectively when the church speak, it speaks, it's Christ speaking. But then of course you get to exactly what you're saying. Ultimately, it's not. There's not this there's not this hive mind blob that's talking and it's like directly possessed in a literal sense by Christ itself. It's 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 it is in the end human people or well, humans who are ultimately themselves fallible and it's a it's a collection of fallible humans um, who say things, <clears throat> um, having deliberated on them, they can be correct, they can be wrong. I mean, there's honestly as 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 sophisticated as as other traditions can get. There's really no way to get around it. The fact that because even even granting granting for a second the categories of infallibility, which you might not um, like, not that you reject it, but that it's just it's just that the framing you don't like. I've seen you discuss that. Um, that to grant the categories of infallibility, we say that with that we they would say that the apostles themselves, the authors of scripture, are themselves like infallible. They are the authors of the holy scripture. They're directly inspired by the Spirit. Um, they they cannot err and all that. And that's something that they wouldn't say for the fathers. Some Orthodox, I see, they 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 give they ascribe some weird like lower tier of inspiration to the fathers that elevates their authority, but they could still err. So in the end, it really doesn't matter when you think about it. But it, fact is, as long as everyone acknowledges the church fathers themselves are individually fallible, then I can't really see a logical a logical way in which to say that somehow when they come together, they are fallible. Unless, of course, you get a direct statement from Christ that says when X number of bishops come together in this part, then whatever you guys pronounce will be directly and divinely guaranteed by the Holy Spirit and it cannot err, which, of course, Christ never says that. It kind of has to be extrapolated from unrelated passages. So, uh, yeah. yeah, 
but that's something we'll definitely get more into for tomorrow. I keep on, I keep on hyping up tomorrow because that, <laughs> and, and I guess it's right because that one's going to be the real spicy one. Um, I might even I might even deliberately put the link in these in this Orthodox Discord channel I'm in. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how wild I'm 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 intending to get. <laughs> but so Let's now we have this orientation of how we should view the church fathers. How you say we should view them as dialogue partners, which is a really beautiful way to put it. And I see. Um, I remember seeing your your blog article on that where you basically make that same argument. And I'll post that in the in the live chat in a sec so people can go read that. Um, really. The, that's really the best way to, to look at it in my in my estimation as well. And so with that framing in mind, when a person understands that, okay, the fathers are dialogue partners, they are people with insights, we should definitely give them respect. And as someone in, in more his, in well, historical and a lot of linguistic like research and that myself, they have some degree of epistemic privilege in the simple sense that they are native speakers of a certain language. So if we're going to have debates over what a certain word in the Bible means, then particularly earlier fathers will be useful for learning what, what does that word mean um, in context X or Y, cultural context as well. But e even that can wane, even that wanes as the centuries and decades and that go on as language changes, as culture changes. But nonetheless, they can have some, they do have some degree, some degree of epistemic privilege, particularly the earlier ones. But nonetheless, fundamentally, as you say, they're dialogue partners. And with that framing in mind, um, with when a person has that in mind and they're picking up, say, their volume of the Apostolic Fathers, like this bad boy right here, um, what principles would you say, um, what principles of interpretation should Protestants adopt as they are reading these fathers? Well, one thing that I, I, I see a lot, or at least I, I take it that this is happening, I could be mistaken, um, is that people read the church fathers, especially these early fathers, and they do sort of interpretation by word association. Um, they think that if Ignatius talks about the Eucharist or the Didache, for example, talks about the Eucharist, therefore, you know, because Protestants don't use that language, therefore it's referring to what the Catholics and the Orthodox mean by Eucharist. Um, if, um, you know, that, that's really a, 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 a clear example. Another example, if Irenaeus talks about the succession of bishops and, the, and Tertullian talks about the succession of bishops and Origen talks about the succession of bishops, mm -hmm. therefore they have in mind what contemporary Catholic theology or Eastern Orthodox theology means by the succession mm -hmm. of bishops. And that is not careful interpretation. That's just word yeah. association. Yeah, you just have somebody who, yeah, you just have somebody who, you know, comes from a tradition where they don't talk like this. You read the church fathers, you get the initial impression that they're talking just like the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. And you say, oh, they must agree with what the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox say. Now, I think actually, if you read carefully, you will find that's not true. Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy um, are not theologically identical to the earliest witnesses to what would later become the Catholic tradition, Irenaeus, Ignatius, uh, Tertullian, mm -hmm. these guys. They're not identical. Um, me phrases that these fathers use come to mean something different, uh, something more than what they originally meant uh, in later theology, because the situation is different. I mean, every historical, every theological statement is conditioned. The way I talk is the is a result of the fact that I live in the age that I do, uh, that I have had the experiences that I have, that I've studied what I've studied, that I see things the way I do, right? The, it, the same thing is true for the early church fathers. Um, every statement is historically conditioned. It's it, it its meaning is at least a part, at least in part, a, re, a result of what where it was uh, stated. Uh, and mm -hmm. so you have to read these early church fathers for themselves. You cannot read them simply in light of what other people say about them later on. Uh, this is something that has come up a lot in uh, my videos about the Eucharist. I mm -hmm. argue, for example, that Ignatius, that Irenaeus, that Justin, that the Didache do not have to be, and perhaps ought not be interpreted in light of the real presence tradition. I actually think that you can, you can at least, but possibly should read them as memorialists of a certain kind. Um, now people will say, okay, the statements that they make are sort of ambiguous, but these get clarified later on in the tradition. And you should read these earlier figures in light of the later traditions where the statement of the real presence is more explicit. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to agree with you that they are talking about the same thing or, or they believe the same things. You know, mm -hmm. these later these later figures are at the at best commentators uh, on these earlier figures, or else they're simply uh, inheritors of the tradition of these earlier figures that has under, undergone developments and evolution. So I do not take for granted, for example, that Augustine agrees with Irenaeus. 
I don't take for granted that Augustine agrees with Ignatius. I don't take for granted that John of Damascus agrees with the Didache or whatever. There are people who live at different times uh, and the people, and every person should be read in light of himself. He should not be read in light of people who come after. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's another thing that I would say. I would say, read the early church fathers. First of all, don't do word association, right? Mm -hmm. See actually, how do they use the word Eucharist? How do they use the word apostolic succession? What does it mean for them? Yep. Um, and if you want, we can talk about specific examples later. Uh, so don't do theology by word association. In the second place, do not read them with 2,000 years of Christian theology in mind. They don't have that. They, you know, Irenaeus came 150 years after Christ. He was not 2,000 years after Christ like we are. So you mm -hmm. cannot assume that he uses the words the same way that later figures in the tradition would use them. You cannot Absolutely. assume that he means the same thing that we do. You cannot assume that when he makes certain statements, uh, about the Eucharist or whatever else, uh, you have to, you know, he means exactly what the real presence tradition says later or the apostolic succession of later generations. Uh, you know, he understands it the same way and so on. You have to read everybody for himself and you cannot read them with 2000 years of theology in mind because they didn't have that history. They might mean different things by the phrases that they use uh, compared to later figures. 100%, so 100% true. There's a far out 12 billion examples I can think of. And most most relevant that comes to mind would be probably Clement of Rome, for example. I'm doing on the, I want to say my 3rd of January, I believe. So that would be your second. Um, I'm having a presentation on my channel then um, about the, the ecclesiology of Clement of Rome and basically doing exactly that, actually going to what does this guy actually say about how the church ought to function, how, how it is structured, um, at least in his time, what did he say to the schismatics in the Corinthians in light of them overthrowing their their bishops or their overseers? Because, of course, bishop is a very loaded term, given our whole high church, low church thing. Um, and going through that and giving first giving a positive, a positive analysis of what he actually says about ecclesiology. And then in light of that saying, OK, how does this compare and contrast with the high church traditions? And I'll basically be. So to give it a spoiler, I'll basically be saying exactly that, that the, the, when, when Catholic apologists and Orthodox apologists, um, and even scholars, of course, um, will point to these passages in Clement where he says, for example, the apostles set up successes so that uh, because they saw, foresaw with perfect knowledge that there would be strife over the bishop's office. So they set up these people to be in it. And then so that once they died, other people can take over their ministry after them, so on and so forth. And they read that and they're like, oh, look, see, there's apostolic succession. And of course, I would say, well, in the in the most literal sense of the term, yes. But in the sense, in the highly developed theological categories of orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, where the succession itself is the emphasis, and um, and not as much. Of course, they would say it's important, but not as much as Clement does the ministry itself. Well, n no, because he doesn't he doesn't exhibit their categories. To give a little spoiler, he doesn't exhibit their categories of, for example that a special teaching charism um, or, or general charism is passed on to a, a new overseer when they're ordained, quote unquote, uh, so that the sacraments are suddenly valid, baptisms are valid and all, all that jazz. That Those categories, Clement doesn't mention that. Maybe he believes them. I'm going to argue that, I'm going to argue that given some very strategic silences and things he does say, um, <clears throat> speak against, uh, let's say, Roman Catholic or an Orthodox Clement and that he's actually... So we, shall we say a little bit Protestant in his thinking? Um, so that's that's basically some stuff I'm going to argue because ultimately they, they, he says things with the example of Clement of Rome. He says things which the lowest of the low church Baptist agrees with. That's that's simply not apostolic succession. Simply saying that the apostles set up these people as heads of ministry and they expected them to be able to pass it on to people after they died. That's not apostolic succession in Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. There's many more categories in that statement. So... As soon as they read that into it, they're already committing a, a, a terrible anachronism. And um, perhaps you can give an example that you're also quite familiar with in how this happens in these apologetic circles, how the very clear and blunt word concept fallacies are put into play. Yeah, that's that's a very good example. I would point to other examples of apostolic succession being abused in this respect. Uh, for example, uh, Prescription against the heretics by Tertullian. That's you know one of the go-to texts for people who try to prove that the notion of apostolic succession is of ancient pedigree. Because effectively what Tertullian is trying to argue in that work is that he can show that the heretical or Gnostic interpretation of scripture can't be true without even trying to interpret scripture. He can just point to the fact that the teaching of the apostolic churches, the churches where um, 
you know, the, the church is founded by the apostles themselves does not agree with it. And anybody can go to these churches and see that they don't teach those things. Uh, so therefore, the heretical interpretations can't be true because the, ch the church is founded themselves by the apostles and which can enumerate their teachers from the apostles to the present day have no such teaching. Now, this is what's interesting, because in, in that book, in uh, chapter 32, he says, look, imagine even that the heretics could unroll a list of their teachers going back to some apostle. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't prove anything, says Tertullian, because no apostle could possibly have taught the contradictory things that they are teaching. That's it. Uh, but in the second place, these these heretics, says Tertullian, will be put to shame by those churches which are being founded every day in our present times, uh, which cannot trace their founding to an apostle, and yet which are accounted apostolic because they agree with the teaching of the apostolic churches. Now, notice mm -hmm. what Tertullian does not say. Mm -hmm. He does not say that these churches are apostolic because their bishops can trace their ordination by means of other bishops back to an apostle. He doesn't mention that at all. He doesn't even care about that. <clears throat> if he had those categories in mind, this would be the time to mention it. He would say these mm. churches are apostolic only because their bishops uh, are in, uh, you know, some sort of uh, bureaucratic successional tie to the apostles by means of other bishops. Uh, he doesn't say that. You know, for all I know, in 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 uh, in I, Tertullian's time, maybe that wasn't the universal practice. Maybe they did not always have a bishop ordain other bishop. Maybe somebody died, and then somebody somebody else from the congregation just sort of took over. As far as I know, that's possible. Maybe that wasn't a universal practice, but it's not impossible. But the thing that he does point to is the fact that these churches are apostolic because they agree with the teaching of the apostolic churches. Yep. Another thing that you will not find in Tertullian or in Irenaeus, who also talk about apostolic succession, you will never find them mentioning that bishops have to be ordained by other bishops. Mm -hmm. Now, let me make this point. It does not matter if in their day that was the practice. All right. So you can point to examples, you know, for example, the the apostolic tradition of Hipp Hippolytus or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can point to all these examples where the practice was for other bishops to be present at the consecration of one bishop. That's fine. The fact that they don't use that at all in their theological argumentation shows that that is theologically insignificant to them. That does not matter. The fact that the bishop was ordained by somebody else who was a bishop does nothing for them. What matters for them is that these bishops now have the teaching of the apostles and they pass it down. Um, so that's that's what suggests to me that for Irenaeus and for Tertullian, the notion of apostolic succession is not this notion of like a, a special charism that the office of the bishop enjoys and, you know, by which, you know, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he's made capable of teaching and so on. That, that, that doesn't play any role in Irenaeus and Tertullian's arguments about apostolic succession. What they do argue is that at the apostolic churches, you can name, okay, first there was Peter, then there was this guy, 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 all the way down to the present day, our guy. And none of these people know anything like what the heretics are talking about. They have never taught any of the things that the heretics teach. So that is for them what matters as far as apostolic succession is concerned. The fact that you can trace back the present leaders to an apostle and none of the people in the meantime know about these teachings. That's what That's shows it. that those teachings are not apostolic. But the fact that one bishop was ordained by another bishop, that plays no role in their argumentation. They never even mention it. Uh, they don't even mention it in times when it would be to their advantage to mention it. Uh, so that, that would be one example. Another example that I want to mention here, um, let me see, I, I, it, it just slipped my mind. Um, Let's think, Eucharist, priesthood, yeah, um, yeah, it, it might have been about the Eucharist. I don't want to keep up too much time because if it doesn't come to me, then that's fine. But no, that's that was fair. one. I, I think this is really the, the the really the big meat of the of the interview, so we can go for we can go for a bit longer. I reckon. So, yeah, I think I I like what you said earlier about bishop being a loaded term. One of the mm -hmm. problems is that these texts are being translated using terms with a lot of theological baggage, mm -hmm. uh, but the original Greek terms need not have had that baggage. So there's a kind of a mistranslation going on here. I wish that somebody would come up with a translation of Irenaeus or a translation of of uh, the Didache or whatever using the terms overseer mm, and uh, that, and yeah. elder, right? Instead of presbyter and bishop, precisely so that the connotative force of those terms can be lost and you can start to mm. get a sense of what actually he's trying to say. Um, yep. I wish they would come out with a translation of the Didache or of Irenaeus or whatever, instead of calling it the Eucharist, calling it the Thanksgiving. Because if you call it the Thanksgiving, suddenly it loses this, you know, these connotations mm -hmm. with yeah. Eucharistic theology yeah. in the in the high church traditions. Yeah. And that's it, what they were saying. They were not saying yeah. the Eucharist, they were saying the Thanksgiving. And, and I it think doesn't that disprove it doesn't disprove their high church theology, but it does 
make a bit more of a fair playing field for everybody who wants to investigate this stuff. Exactly. It 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 basically prevents us from loading the dice by translating these figures in terms that have come to have more baggage for us than they did for them. Um, or at least we cannot take for yep. we cannot take for granted that it had that baggage for them. Uh, so that would be another, you know, translating. Um, I think that would be very useful. Here's another point that I wanted to mention. A lot of people will read, for example, in Irenaeus that he talks about the bishops and the presbyters. Yep. Um, and people just assume that because he talks about the bishops and the presbyters, therefore he has this, you know, threefold office in mind. He has bishops at the top, presbyters at the middle, and then deacons at the bottom, and then there's a lay people. Um, actually, I think that if you pay close attention, okay, here, here again, it's a matter of reading but not doing word association, actually paying attention yep. to what you're reading. Um, if you pay close attention to the way that Irenaeus argues, it seems clear to me that by presbyters and bishops, he means the same group of people. Uh, yep. Because he will yep. refer to one and the same group of people as bishops in one case and then as presbyters in the other. In Against Heresies, chapter four, uh, excuse me, book four, I believe it's chapter 28. Okay. Uh, if not, then chapter 33, one of those two chapters. I'm, I'm confusing them in my mind. Section three, he says, we should not follow those presbyters who are puffed up with the pride of holding the chief seat. Uh, but it is incumbent upon us to follow the presbyters who are in the church, who have received the sure gift of truth from the, uh, you know, uh, from the apostles and so on. So notice, he says that people, false presbyters, are puffed up with the pride of holding the chief seat. Now, if he believed that the position of presbyter was above the position, uh, the, position the position of bishop was above the position of presbyter, he would not have said that a presbyter holds the chief seat because that wouldn't be true. Mm. A presbyter does not hold the chief seat in the in that you know, threefold office. Um, but because he says that there are false presbyters who take pride in holding the chief seat and they live in sin and they're puffed up with pride and so on, we should not follow them, but we should follow the presbyters who obey the teaching of the apostles. Now, why would we follow presbyters? Why doesn't he say that we should follow the bishops? Because again, he would be arguing from the weaker instead of from the stronger position. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, why should we follow the presbyters when the bishops are even higher than them? It would make more sense to say that we should follow the bishops. But he doesn't say that. He says the presbyters. Why is that? Because for him, the bishops and the presbyters are the same people. They're, they're the same groups. Now, how to make sense of this? Alistair Stewart has come out with a book in 2014 called The Original Bishops. Uh, it's a fantastic book. And basically, he argues that in the, the earliest organization of the church is as follows. Every congregation was headed by somebody called a bishop the uh, the overseer, right? He was probably the householder who owned the house where the people would gather. That guy was the bishop. Now, in cities where there were multiple churches, churches would start to form federations with each other. And they would, you know, form like a network of churches like you might have a Hillsong network or whatever, you know, basically like the things that non-denominationals and charismatics do in, in America and around <laughs> the world. They would have networks of churches, right? That are independent congregations. Oh yeah, the apostles of Pentecostals guys. Get yeah. that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably they were. Um, so they Ooh, would form Christ. networks, they would form networks of churches and, um, uh, Stuart says that these bishops, when they would gather in a group in their networks as a collective, they were called the presbyters. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically the idea is that the, uh, a bishop, a person is bishop because he's a leader of his own congregation. And when he gathers in connection with other churches, uh, with other leaders of other churches in a network in his town, uh, then he's called a, a presbyter, right? So the presbyters are this collection of lead pastors, basically, of individual congregations uh, considered collectively, whereas each lead pastor was considered a bishop within the context of his own church. Now, later over time, these networks of pastors chose one person to be on top of the whole, a sort of a primus inter pares, uh, and that guy became the monarchical bishop, the monepiscopos. Uh, but the original arrangement was not like that. In the original arrangement, the bishop is the leader of an individual congregation, and the gathering of individual leaders uh, would have been called uh, the, pres uh, the presbyters. Uh, so now why is it then that, at that Irenaeus can talk about the presbyters as holding the chief seat? Because every presbyter would have been the episcopos in his own congregation. He would have been the lead pastor of his own church. So that's why he's puffed up with having the chief seat, not because... Um, it would not make sense if you know there was a position of bishop above that of the presbyter, but it would make sense to say that if anybody who was a presbyter was within his own congregation, the leader. Um, so here again, word association. You know, there are all these things that uh, Irenaeus says that don't make sense if you think that he had a threefold office in mind with the bishop above the presbyter. But what he says do make does make sense if you 
pay attention to him closely and you see that actually uh, every person would have been called a bishop over his own congregation and a presbyter in connection with the bishops of other congregations. Mm -hmm. um, so here's another sense in which apostolic succession, bishop, presbyter does not mean the same thing for Irenaeus as it does in the present day. Uh, so this would be a further example. Yeah, yeah, really, really good example. And when you mentioned um, earlier with the ordination of bishops, that's another really big, big thing I'm going to talk about with First Clement, how he He's, he's describing the exact process of, well, or generally speaking, the process of how the apostles would establish bishops and then how they expected more bishops to come about. Where we'd have in first Clement, got my nice little volume right here. Clement would end up saying, um, for this reason, therefore, having received complete foreknowledge, and this is chapter 44, for people who are wondering, uh, they appointed leaders mentioned earlier and afterwards gave the officers a permanent character. That is, if they, the apostles, should die, other approved men should succeed to their ministry. These, therefore, who are appointed by them, the apostles, or later on by other bishops, other presbyters? No, by other reputable men with the consent of the whole church. Now, I know orthodoxy and Catholicism say, yeah, we have the consent of the whole church, like with orthodoxy, for example, in their ordination ceremony, um, the whole congregation will say axios or anaxios, worthy or unworthy and all that. Um, and it's, it's more or less a formality, but technically there's some consent of the whole church. But the fact is the appointment is by not, Clement doesn't say it's by other bishops or by other presbyters, but by other reputable men, literally in the Greek, uh, elogimon andron, and mm -hmm. specifically not just men in like a gender neutral sense, but literally men, other, other reputable men. Point being, he doesn't, he's, he's not saying that this is some demand of the, that this is some necessity of having a direct succession of one bishop and then goes to another bishop, or even if we grant non, non uh, sorry, plural episcopacy of some bishops elect another bishop and they elect another bishop and so on and so forth. It is the, the men in the congregation themselves, the reputable men of the congregation themselves who set up their leaders, which ends mm -hmm. up making the authority structure, at least according to Clement, um, not a, not a top down thing of ordination where a bishop has to, or bishops have to ordain other bishops or bishops can ordain priests and then down to deacons and so forth. It's the other way around. It goes from the congregation up into the deacons and the bishops or overseers, to use the more neutral term. Correct. So, so, so even then, obviously, the the key response that Roman Catholics and Orthodox may say is that, well, we don't, we 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 totally agree with this statement. There's we're, we're not. There's nothing against it. But then, of course, there's the issue of, well, well, hang on. That's the thing is, that's all he says. That's right. the extent of it, according to Clement or some other father, if we're talking about another topic. It doesn't matter if you agree with it. The fact is, that's what he's saying is the core of it. And, and really, Roman Catholics and Orthodox can't agree with this statement where the appointment itself, not merely the consent. So he says the consent of the whole church, but that's followed by the direct appointment by other reputable men, not men who are bishops, not men who are presbyters, but other reputable men. And that's a very valid argument from what from from a silence because one would expect if Clement is trying to uh, he's, he's impugning schismatics who overthrew their 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 presbyters. This is the exact situation that apostolic succession is supposed to be a total safeguard against. Where if they throw overthrow their bishops, okay, that's it. They're out of the successional line. They're no longer valid. They are outside of the church. Clement does impugn them with sim, but it doesn't emphasize that they're out. He doesn't say anything about how they're now outside of the successional office. That their sacraments are invalid, that they are no longer able to appoint new presbyters or so on and so forth. So that's, so that is yet again, another beautiful example of just how anachronistic thinking really makes you miss a lot in these texts. I agree with you entirely. I, I, I mean, part of it here is that as a responsible reader, this is why it's dangerous, right? You go in as somebody who grew up in a non-denominational, some kind of Protestant background where people talk differently. Uh, you read the Church Fathers for the, first, for the first time. You hear them using all these terms that are familiar to you from Roman Catholicism, Mason Orthodox, mm -hmm. and you just get swept. Oh, they must be just... You have to be able to understand the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox theological paradigm and to be able to discern the fact that these figures are not arguing the way they do. Even if they use the same terms, they don't use them in the same way in order to make arguments. Um, and mm -hmm. the things that you would expect them to say if they did have this Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox you know, theological paradigm in mind, they end up not saying. What they do say, on the other hand, is less than what the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox want to say. Now, why is it less than? Because Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy is a development of the primordial Christian theology. It is not the primordial Christian theology. It is a development of it. Um, you know, just like, for example, when you plant a seed, 
uh, in the ground, right? And then a tree grows and then it lets off other seeds and then a forest grows, all right? The forest is not what was there from the beginning. And there are all these other factors that have intervened in the meantime uh, in order to get the forest that we have now. But it's not, it wasn't like that from the start. Um, and you can always ask the question, okay, is this a good or a bad development? Um, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox, this is the point that I would make. They are not perfectly theologically identical with the earliest church. They are developments of that early church. Uh, they are that early church as it transformed uh, throughout history. And it came to, you know, into new situations and began to argue differently and to use familiar terms in different ways than it had from the beginning. Uh, but this is the trick of it. Because the Roman, uh, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, theological paradigms use the same terms, they give the false impression that they are theologically identical with the earliest church. This, mm -hmm. is, where the, this is where there's a, an aspect of deception involved. Because yep. we talk like them, therefore they agree with us. Actually, yep. they don't agree with you because they don't argue like you. They, the concepts don't evidently have the function for them that they do for you. It's just that you happen to be using the same terms. Um, so this is where you have to really read carefully. You have to pay close yep. attention to the arguments that are being made and to not let yourself get swept away by word associations. Now, with respect to your point about uh, appointing uh, overseers and deacons, the same thing appears in Didache chapter 15 uh, mm -hmm. in verses yep. 1 and 2 or 2 and 3, I think. There it says, appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons, for these mm -hmm. will do the service of the apostles for you, right? Um, yep. Notice, the Didache is addressed to churches where you would have you know, itinerant prophets and apostles coming by and they would preach and they would teach and so on. Um, but it says how to treat them if they stay too long, kick them out because they're false prophets and so on. Uh, but appoint for yourselves, bishops and deacons. Mm -hmm. Notice what he doesn't say. Choose some people and then we will send an apostle to, to you know, or ordain them for you. He doesn't say that. Very good observation, yeah. He, 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 they, he, they cannot even say that because in the earliest days, you could not take for granted that you would have access to other churches with a bishop in place. Every mm -hmm. congregation had to be capable of taking care of itself because that's just the nature of things. This was the new yeah. religion that was starting up in places where people had never heard of it before. So when the Didache says, appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons, it seems to me what it's saying is, okay, choose some reliable people from your own congregation, your own groups, and let him be the leader. Okay, pray mm -hmm. for him and let him be the leader. And if he should die, have somebody else come into place and don't be without a leader. Don't leave yourself vulnerable, but, you know, select a leader for yourself uh, so that you're not dependent on these itinerant apostles and prophets and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that you don't leave yourself at the mercy of potential tricksters. Uh, so I think also in the Dita K, when it says a point for yourselves, basically the presupposition of that commandment is the self-sufficiency and the autonomy of the local congregation. He could not say a point for yourselves uh, if he did not think that each congregation was supposed to be capable in principle of taking care of itself. So this would be, I think, a further uh, a further point to your favor, uh, a comparison between the DDK and the and First Clement. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Totally, totally beautiful and accurate. And we're making we're making a good, pre pretty good time right now. There was another question I'd queue up, like I'd queued up, what major mistakes do you see people make who... You see people who read the fathers make so that they cross the Tiber and the Bosphorus. But I think we more or less kind of went through that really, really easily. It's all these ideas, these these major fallacies of word concept fallacies of anachronism. Um, and, uh, and another one, another one I'll often see, maybe you will have a, I think you have, may have a little bit of experience with that is um, a, a, a couple of others. So arguments from authority. Oh, most scholars say this. Most scholars say that. Oh, look, J&D Kelly says that, uh, that Justin Martyr shouldn't be read as giving a symbolic Eucharist. Uh, among a billion other things, and then the argument from incredulity. But I, I guess the argument from authority as well. How would you tackle that one? Um, I, I know how I would. It's pretty, yeah, but I'd love to see how you go. Well, I would say that um, basically what happens is I, th I think these concepts of orthodoxy and heresy only arise once we no longer are confident that we can, uh, you know, make founded judgments about things on our own. Right. Once we no longer think that we have access to the things on our own, then we have to rely on the testimony of others. And if you have enough people, uh, you know, saying the same thing, then that becomes an orthodoxy. And then to go against that orthodoxy is questionable. Uh, you know, so you just accept what most people say instead of uh, determining whether the thing is true. So the basically what happens is the preoccupation with um, orthodoxy and heresy arises only after you think that you don't have access to the thing itself. You have to rely on what other people who know more than you say. Um, and so then, you know, you, you go with the majority or you go with the ones who seem to have the most prestige or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know in any other field of inquiry where this happens and it's not, um, and it's not decried as unscientific. Right. I mean, in any other in any other field of inquiry, we think it doesn't matter if the majority of 
the authorities in the present you know time say this that they could still be wrong in science right again to return to Pannenberg Pannenberg makes the point even if everybody agreed on something that would not make it true right yeah. at some point all the relevant authorities uh, on the matter thought that the uh, sun revolved around the earth and then later Galileo comes along and proves that wrong okay yeah. So it doesn't matter if all the authorities in some place say something, they could still be wrong. And it's it's yeah. open, you know, there's a possibility that you have to test what they say against what they're talking about and see if it matches up. Um, now, for whatever reason in theology, people don't care about that anymore. They don't care for theology to be scientific and rigorous. It's enough for them just to have the, you know, the orthodox opinion of their trusted authorities. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't agree with that. I don't. I don't think that that's proper method. Now, not everybody is up to the task. That's true. Not everybody can be a you know an academic theologian. But at the same time, it's not as if theology is so difficult. The essentials of the Christian faith are very easy. Anybody can read the Gospel of Mark um, and get the main idea, which is that this Jesus died for our sins and that he calls on people to believe in him. And I want to do that too. It's not that hard. Now, people will say this, okay, but there are all these other opinions, all these other theological ideas that are necessary for salvation also, and you can't have those, you know, you can't just read those right out of scripture. But I can deny that. Why should I think that those are necessary, right? So it's it's like Roman Catholic theology, for example. They'll say, listen, if there were not an infallible magisterium in place, then we would not have reliable access to the saving truth. And we all know that the saving truth is so complicated and hard to find out, right? So we can't just leave it at the mercy of people. Why do I agree that that's the saving truth? Why do I have to agree that your, you know, doctrinal theoretical complex is what's going to save me? Why shouldn't I just agree that the simple thing that anybody can get, that's what saves me. And your mm -hmm. other opinion may be true, it may be false, but it's not necessary for salvation. Well, of course, if you admit that, then the necessity of the magisterium goes away. So basically it has nothing to yeah. sell you anymore if it can't convince you that it needs you. Uh, but that's not my problem. Um, so basically what I would say is that, you know, in any other domain of inquiry, in any other field, uh, proper scientific research, properly rigorous research means that you don't just take for granted what everybody's saying, but you test it. Uh, so also in theology, for whatever reason, people are unwilling to do this, but that, now here's another problem. Because in the majority of Christian history, if you tested the orthodoxy, you would be lit on fire, okay? Uh, in the present day, maybe you won't be lit on fire, but at the very least, a bunch of people who you might be friends with will look at you in, with suspicion, and then you know, you'll know you be weird, and you won't have anywhere to go to church on Sunday because you're convinced that everybody's wrong about something, but nobody will listen to you. So there are all these non-rational social factors that are involved in preventing people from questioning the orthodoxy uh, or the, the received opinions. Um, yeah. now just because you can threaten me with, you know, uh, fire doesn't mean that yeah. you're right, uh, and <laughs> I can you can still light me on fire and be wrong. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's that's the way that I think about it. There's also people decry secularism. People decry, um, you know, the the separation oh, of yeah, church 100%. and state. But I, I, I think at the very least in this respect, it's beneficial. I now can theologize freely and think for myself and not be in danger of being lit on fire or have to escape to some foreign land yeah. in order to avoid being killed for an opinion. Yeah. Uh, and so, I would and I would distinguish this freedom of of freedom within the Christian paradigm, within the actual truths of scripture themselves. Because obviously it's a, it's another thing if someone decides to go out and start saying, Yeah, these core these core truths of God's word are uh, just yeah, no, I don't believe them. That person can just like I can just drop kick him out of the way. Uh, you can you can go away, please. But um but then it's another thing to within those core truths that are necessary for salvation, necessary for good, godly living and all that to have the freedom of discussion with, I wouldn't even say that's like secularism per se. I like to think of secularism as the, the positive ideology of godlessness, basically a godless society. Oh, look at us humans. We're so great. We can do whatever we want. Oh, except, unless it harms somebody. Cause we can have some, we, we apparently have some, uh, mo some complex of morality. Um, and it just exists just because, um, because I say so, but, um, but in, in the sense, in the sense of just a basic sense of Christian religious freedom, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and that's really that. Really, itself is it, it's it's fundamental, really, to the to the to the, to the gospel, to the apostolic preaching, and all that. They wouldn't. The only time when the apostles, for example, would issue an anathema against someone would be if they're saying something that really does compromise the faith. They would mm -hmm. anathema. Though he would say that he gives an anathema, for example, to uh, the Ju the Judaizers, so called. Uh, who would say that you must be circumcised as well as believing on top of Christ? Because now suddenly they're just invalidating the whole point of Christ's sacrifice. Um, among among other issues, people who believe some absolute wacky, insane stuff. There was plenty, plenty, plenty of people back then, even in Paul's day, 
who they wouldn't be the heretics that orthodoxy and uh, that in Roman Catholicism would say, where if you if you deny that if you deny the specific philosophical notion, for example, of the of Christ having two natures that are two but one together, and if you're a mon- if for example you're a, a monothelite or a monophysite and all that very specific philosophical categories, oh yeah, not you're cut off from the church. See you later, goodbye. But the concerns that the apostles would come against that of things that they would anathematize would be things that were not merely philosophical concepts. Like, sure, if you could argue granting um, granting the normal hypostatic union doctrine, which I do, um, you can grant that other beliefs when they're logically brought down to their road will would lead to error if they're brought to their logical extent. But that's different to a direct belief that direct the truth that directly violates what the christian truth says and that's mm. exactly what the apostles and christ would do they directly attack things that um that would violate that truth in its in its in its fullest extent and so that again that brings us to your idea of the distinction between truth versus orthodoxy and heresy a very very helpful one really really one i've had on my mind for a, a very long time although i'd still use the words orthodoxy and heresy but i'd i'd, I'd keep it interchangeable with truth itself so I would say, for example, yeah, my like for example, iconodulia, um, the idea that you can venerate icons and that's okay. That's orthodox in in the majority of the let's say um, post um, what you call it post seventh ecumenical council world that became orthodoxy. But I would personally still call it heresy because it's not true. It's it's it is well a heresy in accordance with the scriptures, as I would argue. And I intend to make a series on that sometime in the future. Please do not miss that, people. Um, but yeah, so. That's. I want to bring up another example, one a really, really common one that Roman Catholics and such love to do, love, love, love to raise up, and that would be the example of Irenaeus right here, the classic passage in Book Three, Chapter Two of Against Heresies, where he would for everyone watching. I'll read the following. Since, however, it would be very tedious in such a volume as this to reckon up the successions of all the churches, we do put to confusion all those who, in whatever manner, whether by an evil self-pleasing, by vainglory, or by blindness and perverse opinion, assemble in unauthorized meetings. We do, we do this, I say, by indicating that tradition derived from the apostles of the very great and very ancient and universally known church, founded and organized at Rome by, two most, by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, as also by pointing out the faith preached to men, which comes down to our time by means of the successions of bishops. For it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church on account of its preeminent authority. It's patiorem principalitatem. So a classic, classic text often brought up by our Roman Catholic friends. And given everything we've mentioned already, all the principles of proper reading of church fathers, of, of historical documents in general, really, um, and fallacies to avoid and all that. Um, I'll briefly briefly summarize how Roman how you will see Roman Catholics use this passage, and then why it's just not a well, bluntly put, it's just wrong, straightly wrong in how they interpret it. So um, basically, what I would do first that sentence there for it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church on account of its uh, potiorem principalitatem. I translate that as uh, greater preeminence. That's how I, I tend to translate that. So because of its greater preeminence, um, that sentence by itself sounds like it's just enunciating a theological principle that should be valid for all times, right? All churches have to agree with the theology of the Roman church. Uh, why is that? Well, because uh, they're founded by the apostles, Peter and Paul, and perhaps also because there is, you know, here, like in a seed form, the notion of the infallibility of the Bishop of Rome and so on. Well. Um, I can understand why a person would read it that way, but I don't think that there's any necessity in reading uh, Irenaeus that way. And I think actually a closer mm -hmm. reading would suggest against this. So if mm -hmm. you don't mind me, I am going to open up my uh, uh, window mm -hmm. here so I can have the passage in front of me, because one of the things okay. I'm going to try to prove is that um, There is nothing, the, the argument that Irenaeus is trying to make is actually something else. So in section one, just before this, yep. he argues that um, anybody who wants to know the truth, right? Anybody who wants to know what the apostles actually taught can appeal to any of the churches founded by the apostles throughout the world because the apostles took care uh, to appoint uh, successors, you know, to lead the churches after them, to take up their place of government, as Irenaeus says, after they die. Um, and 
they did this, Irenaeus says, with great care. They chose these people very carefully because if these persons should preserve the true teaching, then that would be very good for the church. Uh, but if they should fall away from the truth, then that would be a very great disaster. So notice already in this first section where Irenaeus talks about apostolic succession in any detail, he notes that the bishops of the churches had to be chosen carefully because they could fall away. Now, what happens to this charism of infallibility? What happened to this notion that the bishop has a special teaching charism that helps him, you know, guides him in the truth? This notion doesn't appear in Irenaeus. Rather, in the very first place where Irenaeus begins to talk about apostolic succession in any detail, he already notes that the bishops of the churches had to be chosen carefully because in principle they could have fallen away. Mm -hmm. Now he goes on to say this. Okay, but note, it would be very tedious in a volume such as this to reckon the successions of all the churches. Okay, if I were to list for you all the bishops in Ephesus and Alexandria and all these other places where the, the apostles had churches, that would take forever. So it will suffice to appeal to the very, you know, very great, uh, very ancient and universally known church founded at Rome. Now, why does it suffice to appeal to that church? Because it's a matter of necessity uh, that every church should agree with this one on account of its greater or preeminence. Now this is this is what I'm this is how I would understand the passage. When Irenaeus says that it's a matter of necessity, he is not talking about absolute theological necessity as if in principle every church has to agree with this church. He is talking about conditional necessity. Hmm. What he's saying is that this church because everybody knows it and because everybody holds it in high esteem, it's a matter of necessity that they should agree with it. It's a matter of conditional necessity. Basically the idea is they would not agree with this church or they would not hold this church in such high esteem if they didn't agree with its doctrine, if they didn't think that it held the apostolic doctrine. And so that's why it suffices for his purposes to point to this church, to point mm -hmm. to this particular uh, church of Rome. Uh, but there's nothing about this argument that entails that the church of Rome is unique among all churches as a matter of principle. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing like that follows. And there are a number of scholars who point this out. For example, you can read Eric Osborne's book on Irenaeus. You can read uh, Brian Eno's book on the rise of the papacy, where he talks about this passage. And they all say, for example, it would not have been thinkable to Irenaeus that the, the Roman church uh, should have a special privileged place for Christian theology. That's yeah. not what he's saying. He's saying that it suffices for my point. My point is to prove that these teachings yeah. are not apostolic. It. it suffices for my point to point to this church because everybody holds it in high esteem and they wouldn't do that if they didn't agree with it. Yeah, that's it. And and the and the simple fact that he's not doing this, he's not appealing to Rome in and of itself as that argument, but as he says there, because he simply doesn't have the time and space to list the successions of all the other churches who affirm the true orthodox doctrine. So it's really it's really only a second, it's only really a secondary measure. That's the only reason why he's appealing to Rome specifically rather than all the churches out there. And that in his display here, the difference between Rome and other churches isn't one of kind. That that is the whole other above the other churches, but one of degree. They happen to be the best, it, it seems to be, at least in Irenaeus, the best of all the churches because of these evidentialist um, measures of the fact that they're founded by two of the most, uh, two of the greatest apostles, and as a result have the have the, the richest foundations in the Christian tradition. So, and that's an, that's an evidentialist basis right there. It's, it's more or less akin to me saying, um, I like to follow this excellent, Christian preacher or Christian scholar, for example, because I trust that with with their level of expertise, their wisdom, their experience, and what they've displayed, that they're they're above all other authorities. They're they're preeminent simply because they're extremely well learned. That doesn't mean I'm going to think they'll never make a mistake ever. That I have to submit to everything they say. That I don't have a right to check what they say simply because of their authority. But it simply means that look, I could put a base level of trust into them by default. And that appears here what the, to be what Irenaeus is saying, that just on epistemic grounds, on, on evidential grounds, that the Church of Rome is very, very good to follow. That's not the same thing, as you say, as having some iner inherent power, inherent ability, inherent authority passed down specifically through their bishops. And he doesn't, and, and note how he doesn't really specifically, he doesn't even mention anything specifically about uh, the church, the, the bishops of Rome have preeminent authority, but the Church of Rome, generally speaking, yeah. and it really makes sense to, to think of that in the collective sense, be it the bishops, the presbyters, or the church generally, not even specifically pointing to their authority figures inside, because it's pointing to that idea of the tradition passed into Rome and preserved in Rome, something that would go about through everybody in the congregation, really, not simply 
um, not simply their bishops and their presbyters and all. Obviously, they'd have an important, like a key part in maintaining that, but the emphasis isn't on the fact that they have a bishop of Rome. Um, the same bishop of Rome, by the way, whom Irenaeus would go toe to toe with because he's trying to excommunicate the entirety of Asia Minor over not celebrating the uh, over not celebrating the Paschal feast at the same time he would. So one would think, especially since Irenaeus agreed with this pope, Pope Victor the First, and I have a video on my channel that I a little bit ago put up a little documentary on this situation, the Court of Decimate controversy. So if anyone wants to check that out, you can do that. I'll put a card up after the fact. Um, and if 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 this really was believed that the the Bishop of Rome was supreme over all the church, then it is absolutely bizarre, dare I say, heretical on Irenaeus's part that he would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Victor I, the Bishop of Rome, um, over something that he agrees with him, that they that he and Arius agrees with Victor, that they should celebrate the, the Paschal Feast on this day. But then, and so one would think, okay, if that's the case, and the Pope has declared this to be the case, um, then he's he's totally within his right to, to excommunicate any congregations who refuse to follow him with that. But Irenaeus says, no, don't do that, bro, don't do that. Be charitable. Let people follow these traditions which have existed for a long time. Uh, and he, of course, points to the example of Polycarp and Anicetus um, when they discussed and debated this issue, which thus also gives the idea that for Irenaeus, apostolic tradition, quote unquote, um, is supreme over the Bishop of Rome, even though, according to Roman Catholicism now, the Bishop of Rome is the custodian of tradition. And as unfortunately our Latin mass going Catholic friends are learning right now of Pope Francis' very recent moves against the otherwise traditional quote unquote mass, um, causing a lot of grief there. But I think that's a, I think this, this has been a really good display so far, a really, really good primer on how to read these fathers, how to properly approach them, how to, how, even before you start reading them, how to, how to get the proper mindset of how to consider these fathers, not simply as some untouchable authority for whom you must submit all your decisions to even collectively, but as dialogue partners, as you say towards the beginning of this interview, um, as people who are engaged in an ongoing constant 2000 year dialogue on the truth of Christ. And that's ultimately what it is that we're pursuing the one single truth and not all these the very much later on added philosophical developments, which though they may be true and among other ideas, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that suddenly we have the right to, to just anathematize people out of the church simply because they come to different conclusions than us, which otherwise do not compromise the truth in and of themselves, even if somewhere down the logical line, they might cause a problem. Because if that was our standard of, of, um, of orthodoxy, that an idea going down the logical line creates problems, then we'd pretty much have to anathematize anybody that we know, since there's always some area of disagreement that we have and which down the line we would consider having some problem. But anyway, that's my rambling done. Doctor, before we get on to Q&A, a uh, very brief Q&A, and then the, uh, dare I say, the cream of the crop of today's stream, would you like to plug yourself? Anything you want to plug? Sure. Uh, you know, if, if your viewers are interested, they can look at my YouTube channel. Uh, you can look me up, Dr. Stephen Nemish. Uh, Words of Life with Dr. Stephen Nemish is the name of my channel. Um, you can find a link there to my website, stephennemish.com. Uh, there you can find my curriculum vitae and uh, read my papers. I have basically links to all of my, my published papers uh, posted on my CV, and you can read any of them. You can read about all kinds of different topics because I publish on a lot of issues. Um, you know, hopefully in the near future, I will be able to advertise also certain books <laughs> that I'm that I've published, but we'll have to wait and see for that. I, I, yeah. I do hope that I, one of the books I'm already contracted for, but I do hope that I managed to publish the book on the Eucharist. Um, you know, Lord willing, uh, I'll be, I'll be advertising that one, uh, also, but I guess that's it. That's all that I can say for now. Perfect. Perfect. That's great stuff. Let's jump right into Q and a, and I think we only have, Oh, now we have a third question. Hey, Tui, good to see you, mate. Um, we'll go in order now. So first one we got here, an interesting one by Toby Peralta. Though the term is used differently today, do you think uh, apostle-like leaders exist today? I'm referring to those huge church leaders with big Christian movements in countries like Yongi Cho, etc. So um, I have to admit that my own inclination is to uh, look with suspicion upon anybody who calls himself an apostle. Uh, I just cannot help but to associate apostle in my mind with a special authority that I wouldn't grant to anybody else today. 
Um, but if we are granting our points, so for example, Irenaeus says that he left, the, the apostles left the, their place of government to the bishops of the churches. Now, if you grant what I said earlier, that the bishop is basically the lead pastor of an individual congregation, then in a strict sense, any lead pastor is a, an apostle um, in the sense that he exercises the role in his own congregation, or at least he ought to, uh, that the apostles exercised in their day. Um, now, does that mean that he has some sort of promise of infallibility or anything like that? No, obviously not. Um, should do should individual leaders of congregations think of themselves as apostles? No, they should think of themselves as the stewards of the mysteries of God, which have been handed down to us by the apostles, and they should think that their job is just to take care of what they've been given and not to claim rights for themselves or to... Uh, you know, make use of their authority in ways that, um, you know, uh, go beyond, I think, what's reasonable. Uh, so I don't know exactly who Yonggi Cho is. Uh, maybe you can tell me more about that. But basically, I would say that, like, you know, in principle, the leader of every individual congregation is a successor to the apostles in the strict sense, which this term, uh, uh, w which this term had for figures like Clement or the Didache or Irenaeus, basically just the leader of an individual congregation now that there's not an apostle around. Um, I would agree that every lead pastor of a church is, is and a successor to the apostle in that sense. Um, ideally, they would be a successor to the apostle in the sense that they also only teach the apostles' doctrines and not other doctrines. Um, now, whether they can trace their ordination by means of other persons back to an apostle, I don't know if anybody actually can do that. I also think it wouldn't matter even if you could. Uh, what matters, what's most important is that you are uh, stewarding and preserving and passing on the teaching of the apostles and doing that in the context of your own congregation, which I think is the most important part. Excellent. Yep. Very excellent answer. Couldn't agree more myself. From a man, Andrew Bailey, glad to see you here, man. What is, this, what is the significance of Galileo suggesting a heliocentric solar system? Why was it met with such opposition? A bit of a, bit of a tangent, but I yeah. don't know if you have anything to comment on that. So I do not... I do not know enough about the historical situation to comment intelligently on it. I will just say this point, uh, this, the, the event, the Galileo event, to call it that, is significant because it illustrates the way that human scientific inquiry can function. Mm -hmm. uh, something that was taken for granted and that to a person, you know, just living in the world uh, might seem obvious actually can be false. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, you can have later scientific paradigms that are basically the reverse opposite of the earlier scientific paradigms. Uh, now, what that suggests to me is that truly scientific inquiry is guided by the things themselves alone uh, yeah. and not by what other people say or what is the dominant opinion in the present moment. Um, and Galileo is an example of that, right? A lot of people can be wrong about something and yeah. even wrong about something that appears obvious because, of course, when... Now you and I know that the earth is rotating and that's why the sun seems to go around uh, the earth. But actually to somebody living, you know, not that long ago, it would have been obvious that the sun goes around the earth because you don't feel the earth moving and you see the, uh, the yeah. sun moving. Yeah. Uh, so Galileo is really, um, you know, is really interesting. Basically Galileo teaches us that our initial impressions can be wrong. And even if everybody disagrees with you, you can still be right. Uh, yeah. And so I would say that the same thing can be true in, theology. Um, the same thing can be true in the interpretation of the church fathers and so on and so forth. Yeah, good answer to that. And I will I will say, to be fair, that with the Galileo affair, people can exaggerate that uh, quite a bit as just a Catholic lynching against science and all that. To a, to a small degree, it, it kind of was, but at least from a little bit of stuff that I have read, Galileo kind of kicked up a bit more of a fuss uh, that kind of, uh, how would I say, precipitated his own demise. Like They weren't really persecuting him for the science itself although they did almost all universally disagree with him of course and that's more or less dr nemish's main point here um but uh, in case anyone thinks so it's a bit more complicated than is commonly brought about especially by unbelievers towards the christian faith in general um but to move on now to my man tui good to see you here um uh, I, I i'm still gonna hold that these are that these are silent t's a piece <laughs> silent piece uh, are there good reference works for how different church fathers use theological terms differently I have no idea. Um, I don't know. This is just something that I have come a conclusion that I've come to, you know, to by myself uh, in my research and my reading of the Church Fathers. I wish that I could refer you to something. Maybe one day I'll write a paper about this, but uh, <laughs> for now I don't have a, an answer to this question. 
No, fair enough. Um, I, I would say the best reference would be the fathers themselves. Get yourself a sample of fathers. Like probably the best ones I can think of um, would be the apostolic fathers themselves. So like this volume right here, apostolic fathers, Greek texts and English translations, third edition. Um, and then perhaps some yeah, throwing in some Irenaeus and other figures and all that. And see the topics they discuss, um, see the terms they use and try to see how they use them. Don't assume that they're going to all use them the same or that they're all going to use it differently. Just see as you read, whatever fathers you do, what are these major terms they use? How do they employ them? And then you can you do that for all your selected fathers and come and compare and contrast. Um, it's it, it, it can be, a, it's definitely a, a bit more arduous. Um, that's more or less you getting to the process yourself, but that's more or less really the most reliable way to go about it. As well as of course, reading good secondary sources um, from, from those who study this stuff very deeply and that can give you a good leg up. Um, I do remember one, there's one dictionary, I think in particular, there's a, there's a specific dictionary of Greek terms used in the church fathers, a patristic dictionary or something by a certain something lamp. His last name is lamp L A M P E. Um, and that dictionary focuses on Greek terms used by the church fathers. So that it's an old, it's an older volume. Um, it's, it's a bit expensive to get. But if you have the money, that might be worth uh, pursuing yourself. Um, so yeah, that's something I can I can point you towards. Um, and to go next, my man Steve Christie, good to see you here, mate. Um, when Irenaeus compares the mother of Jesus to virgin soil that was yet tilled, but then tilled later, is this evidence that he believed Mary's virginity wasn't perpetual? I don't know if this is a topic you've gone much yourself into, Doctor Nemish, but um, I don't know. Is this something you can comment about, or not really? Yeah, I don't know. Um... I, I don't really have, uh, I know it's like, you know, the, the worst thing in the world to deny Mary's perpetual virginity because supposedly everybody believed it. Um, I am not committed to it. I'm not against the idea either. It's, it's an open question. It seems really unimportant to me personally. Um, but I could think for example, okay, so by saying that the soil was not yet tilled and then tilled later, um, maybe he means to say that she did not have any children, but then had a child later, or maybe you can say that, um, you know, um, I don't know, maybe the idea is that after she was, I mean, I, I don't, I would have to read the passage. I don't, I don't know enough just by thinking about it, but, um, my sense is that it could be interpreted in ways that are compatible with, uh, the idea that Mary did not have sex after she gave birth to Christ. Um, maybe the idea was just that she went from not having a child to having a child or something. I don't know. I have no idea. I wish I could answer more intelligently. I wasn't expecting the question and I, I, you know, this is not a problem that comes up for me very often. So I, I don't no, have yeah, anything enough, intelligent to enough. say. Hey, that's my, that's my, that's my audience. They'll have questions on a little bit of everything. We kind of, you know, in space of four questions, we've gone from, we've gone from the virginity of Mary all the way up to the Galileo affair and the implications of that. So it's a bit of a, bit of a broad range um maybe maybe this i'm not i'm not sure if you're much of an augustine guy but maybe you can comment on what he mentions here adam here asks regarding augustine he says later in his life in his book retractions that the rock is not peter himself though he previously interpreted the matthew oh it's not a question sorry um the matthew 16 passage that way um and then adam says with that how does rome get around disparate father interpretations on a variety of issues i think this might be something you've experienced well, the it's interesting because on the one hand, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic apologists will claim that the Roman Catholic teaching is found in the church fathers. On the other hand, if you suggest that a church father perhaps did not teach what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, then they'll say, well, the fathers are not infallible. That's why we need the church yeah. to, um, you know. Or even a majority of fathers disagreeing with them on a certain topic yeah. at some point. Yeah. Uh, basically, th I think this is like this is like a game, right? Because on the one hand, you're saying, look, all these people agree with me, right? They they would have agreed with what I said. And then when that's called into question, well, they're not infallible, right? You need me to <laughs> tell you what to believe. Basically, I, th I, I think this is what's going on with Roman Catholic theology. It's, it's worked itself into a loop now so that basically it is itself the standard of the truth of its own statements, yep. right? Uh, this is something that comes up in my discussions with Roman Catholics. For example, I made these videos, Why Remain a Protestant? I made a two-part video uh, series on my YouTube channel the and series. Brian, yeah. And Brian cross responded to it. And Brian cross basically made the point that I was begging the question, um, against Roman Catholicism 
because I was reading certain passages or sources uh, uh, in a way that uh, he thought was circular because I wasn't reading them from within the framework of Roman Catholic theology. Uh, and that's circular because Roman Catholic theology says that they have to be read in this way. Um, now, I think that this is just crazy. I mean, I, I don't know how you could possibly argue against a person who says that you have to see things from my way. And if you give, yeah. if you give an argument that does not come from my terms or from my point of view, then you are begging the question um, against yeah. me. I don't think that that's true. I think you have to prove that the thing has to be seen your way. And if I can offer another view that's better, then why do I believe you? Why shouldn't you believe me in that case? Um, so there is an element of circularity here. Um, yeah. You know, basically the Roman Catholic theology says that uh, the things that it talks about have to be understood from its point of view. Um, but why? You know, why shouldn't you prove rather that your point of view is adequate to the things? Uh, I think that that's the response that I would make. And I think that this is... Uh, yeah. you know, at play in, in the way that Roman Catholic apologists will respond to arguments from the fathers yeah. against Roman Catholic theology. Yeah, 100%. And this is definitely something we're going to get into a lot of depth in tomorrow's second part as we respond directly to challenges like this. And I remember us having that discussion after a little bit of an interaction like that. Um, uh, us, me, me and Dr. Nemes, uh, Nemesh stock, talked about that. Um, and I raised the point that it's valid to talk about how if you're going to argue against us, at least consider the, how through our lens we can read a father like this or that, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's cool to do that. Um, but as I mentioned to Dr. Nemesh, Nemesh as well, a lens is not a blank check, all right? You, can, you can't just plug any statement into a lens and it's, it will suddenly become compatible with that theology. So how a Roman Catholic would say, if you read the church fathers in light of Roman Catholic tradition, then they all agree with us. So you can't use the fathers against us, for example. Um, and to simply illustrate this example, I'm going to give the statement, Christ is not really ontologically present in the Eucharist in any real presence sense. It is purely symbolic. Now, you can't read that statement through a Catholic lens and reconcile that with Roman Catholicism. You can't, right? And any, and any good Roman Catholic, anyone who's not a heretic in their standard would agree with that. But to agree with that, you then have to presume that statements can be read and understood before you apply a lens to them. That is, you can read this statement and judge that it's heretical before you apply the Catholic lens into it, or precisely because you apply the Catholic lens to it and given your understanding of language, of syntax and all that stuff, then you can judge that statement to be heretical. And if that's the case, then it's simply not a given that reading the Church Fathers in a Catholic lens will um, will make them reconciled with Roman Catholicism. Because if, because in theory, in light of that, in theory, a church father or may, many church fathers can say something that does contradict Roman Catholic theology and putting it into a Roman Catholic lens will not help that. Um, so so that that common tactic there, um, Adam, that Roman Catholics will use, that, oh, you've got to read them in the Catholic perspective. Um, in some cases that can work because sometimes there's statements of the church fathers where you could say on their own, oh, that's not what Roman Catholicism says. But then if you read them in a Catholic lens, okay, it is compatible. But then there's others which are quite manifestly clear um, as we will as we'll probably give some more examples of that tomorrow, but we even gave some today and I'll be giving in my presentation on Clement of Rome that they simply do not work under a Catholic paradigm. Like you, you can't just apply a lens to it and you can't just you can't just slap some Newman on it, as my mate Jeff likes to say, and, and say that it, um, that it fixes everything. And I forgot to plug before, by the way, um, when when we talked about towards the very beginning on um, on uh, the reasons why many Protestants go to Roman Catholicism and all. And my man, uh, my man Jeff, uh, whose YouTube channel is a Goy for Jesus, a Goy for Jesus. He has a really, really good uh, scripted video called "The Psychology of Catholic Converts," which basically goes over what what psychology that that uh, Rome, that Protestants in particular go through um, and who end up going to Roman Catholicism, like what their thought processes are. And, and basically a big part of it is this is this insatiable desire for infallible certainty on something. So then, of course, Roman apologists will say, we've got infallible certainty on this, so come to us. And uh, so that's a really good video, really, really good video I recommend. Um, and, oh, we've got one more here. I think we'll this will be our last one from a man, John Bugay. Glad to see you here, mate. Can you discuss the historical errors of Irenaeus and Eusebius, re Simon Magus, Peter following him to Rome, and Jesus' letter to Agba? How do we reconcile these errors. And again, I'm not sure if this is an area of yours, um, but yeah, this is not my area of expertise. So I, I would rather not, uh, comment on it. I don't know enough. Yeah. 
I, I, I can say I can say a little bit about it. Um, we we've had this. Me and me and John have discussed a little bit about Simon Majors and all. I don't think I don't think Irenaeus is is wrong in his in his historical account of Simon Majors. I don't see that that Simon Majors ended up going to Rome and causing more trouble after his account in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, but with Eusebius, but nonetheless, Irenaeus and Eusebius do make other historical errors. And of course, the relevance with that would be that simply appealing to a church father who says something happened in church history, that's not a guarantee of anything because they can make historical errors. For example, with Irenaeus um, saying that this is a tradition teached by the apostle John and other unnamed apostles and in the gospel itself, that Jesus died around 50 something, um, which of course, when you go into the history with chronology and the synchronisms of the gospels, that's not really tenable at all. Um, so even someone as early as Irenaeus can be wrong on historical errors. So that's something that Roman Orthodoxy uh, have to deal with. Um, and I think, uh, no, we, we didn't really address Newman's do, uh, doctrinal development hypothesis. May, may have a little discussion on that tomorrow, see how it goes. Uh, it is it is very, very relevant and I think ends up being the Achilles heel for Rome itself. But now we, uh, we've gone a little bit over the intended time. I hope that's all right with you, Dr. Nemesh. I hope the seat isn't exactly killing you right now. Um, it's all right. Perfect, perfect. Because now we are going into the cream of the crop of this stream. That is our meme review. <laughs> All right, people, this is the fun part. This is the real good part. And of course, with every single one, um, I want to come up with some kind of rating system that's at least somewhat relevant. Um, Dr. Nemish, what's the Romanian currency? How do you pronounce it? Lei, L-E-I, Lei. Yeah, it means Le. lions. Lei, okay. And is that plural or is that? It's a plural, yeah. It means lions, strictly speaking. Okay, cool. Lay. Okay, cool. So our rating system is going to be from zero to ten lay. Um, <laughs> and the beautiful thing about the beautiful thing about these kinds of meme reviews with scholars is that now memes are getting peer reviewed. I mean, not that I ascribe infallibility to peer review, of course. In fact, I think there's a lot of problems with the process, but it is cool nonetheless to to say that hey, my memes are peer reviewed. So don't don't dog them. So here's our first one. Just one like, and I'll start doubting Christ's real presence for literally no reason. Like. Say no more. <laughs> and this is one This is one that Dr. Nemish himself actually sent to me. So I can already imagine you're going to give it a high rating. Yeah, I think I think this one is pretty good. Now, I'm, I'm sort of a strict judge. Um, so I think I will give this one seven lay. Uh, I think it's good because I like this format, right? Somebody mm -hmm. basically like, you know, pretending to to, you know, ask people for their opinion, but really just using that as an excuse to do something, you know, on their own initiative. I also like the connection between Zwingli and uh, doubting Christ's real presence for literally no reason. Uh, now, if, if you read, if you read Zwingli himself, he gives plenty of reasons why he doesn't have Christ's presence. But, you know, I, I think this is amusing because that's kind of the impression that people have, um, you know, that like Zwingli just sh showed up out of nowhere and started yeah. talking about how Christ is not really present. i of course, I, I don't think that that's actually the way things went, but it, it's funny yeah. to present it that way. It is funny to think about. This is the probably the one little bone of a meme that we'll throw to the papists and the orthodox, because uh, this is probably made by one of them. But uh, <laughs> it's just, it just shows how much of a Chad intellectual vagabond that Zwingli was. Um, Got to love the man in, in some respects. <laughs> don't call yourself a trad if your toilet doesn't face ad orientum. Bishop Robert Barron, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you're a member of that group. Uh, comments from Christian pages on pictures of theologians. Oh, I do. Yep. That's yeah. Where so I that's do. that's where you got this from. Yeah. I I love that page, and sometimes there's just absolutely brilliant stuff that comes out of it. Um, but I I really like this. You know, I like it because it 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 takes the notion of trad to like an extreme, right? You know, even yeah. even when you're on well, the toilet, you have to be to facing east. <laughs> Yeah. You got to be facing the east all the time, man. That's that's in case anyone doesn't know. That's what it means ad orientum towards the east, because um, tr trad Roman Catholics will say that the um, certain things in the mass. I forgot exactly what. I think maybe the priest bowing, for example, um, he needs to face the east when he does that. So that's your trad cat uh, trad Catholics. Uh, hopefully, my trad Catholic mates are following the same ones who are watching today. The same ones who I had that really nice party at my place yesterday. Um, but yes, how many how many lay do you give that? Uh, this one is good. I will give it also a seven lay. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that's going to go up soon. Atheists, when they sneeze and you don't say peer reviewed studies, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, I, this one, I think is, it's okay. It's not as clever as the other ones. Um, I mean, in my mind, like 
I don't think there's any connection between atheism and like uh, an obsession with peer review science or anything like that. I think some atheists are, but I, I think there are plenty of people well, who are I mean, atheists who just I, don't I care. In my experience, they'll 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 throw that a lot with um, at least at least the the, the very secularist minds because you see with the very secularist mindset, at least in my experience, they'll often make this appeal to authority. Um, that can be secularized Christians as well, but it's very secularist nonetheless, where they treat scientists as more or less the the church fathers of well of of well, science. Um, yeah. But I, I do see that a lot, and they get the Mickey taken out of them. And in my opinion, it is very much justified. <laughs> How many ladies give this one? I'll give this one between five and six. I I think okay. it 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 could have been better. The font could have been better, and I think that the image might have been funnier too. So the the concept is there, but I don't think the execution is perfect. I love the image. The image is perfect to me, but oh well, whatever. This is UP reviewing it. Look what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. <laughs> Look at this whole church wise need. We just need a Billy Graham crusade. That's all we need. They need all these priests and ordinations and bishops and Eucharists and this and that. <laughs> See, I like this. I like this because um, you know, I um really this, you know, you're not a Protestant unless you think that the gospel is the most powerful you know weapon of the church against the gates of hell so to speak That's uh, it, yeah. and for the gospel you don't need all that other stuff it's nice to yeah. have it 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 hmm. is aesthetically pleasing yeah. it creates a nice liturgical experience so i i go to a traditional anglican church i'm not against all that stuff i like hmm. it all yeah. um but i i think at the end of the day as a protestant i i have to say the gospel is what yeah does it you know you can have all that other stuff without the gospel it doesn't matter uh, yeah. so i i quite like this one i will give this one a seven and a half Woo! Okay, okay, we're going up with the scale, and I personally, I personally go even further. I think that going out of our way, um, in in reverence and even in aesthetic, as much as as much as we feasibly can do for our church and for our service, I think that's a proper way of showing reverence to God, doing as much as we can. But in the end, as you say, it's it's whatever we have, even if we have absolutely nothing except the clothes in our back. If we have the gospel, that's all the power we need. That's in in the end, many Christians, that's that's all they did have: the clothes in their back and a few bucks for some bread at the local market. And and yet if they had the gospel, they had everything they needed. You, They didn't have to partake in a number of uh, loop-de-loop rituals in order to keep their salvation. But uh, anyway, Chad Luther saves Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one because it's subversive, right? So oh, yeah. many people on the internet think that Luther ruined Europe. And uh, I really like, you know, uh, this subversive element because... I don't know why it is, but somehow, you know, internet meme culture and especially like the stuff coming out of 4chan <laughs> is like co-opted by, you know, traditional Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. And they, oh, yeah. they go around saying, you know, based, whatever, based and Pope pilled, all that stuff, they, the way they talk to each other. I like when people take this stuff and use their weapons against them, you know, so like, you know, pointing out, uh, you know, uh, that... Martin Luther actually saves Europe because that implies <laughs> that the, you know, that implies that the medieval Catholic Church under which Europe was control was not a good thing. It was a bad thing, and it was good that uh, it lost its control over Europe. Fine by me. I agree with that. So I, I like this because it's subversive. Um, I like it because it's in your face. It's it's against what you would expect, especially given the 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 format of it. This is the kind of meme that like you know these rad trad types would make but to yeah. use it in a way that subverts their purposes i, I quite like it and i think absolutely. it's cooler absolutely and i'll give awesome. this one an eight perfect oh look at that eight out, eight out of ten layer that's awesome and a lot of them a lot of them will end up replying with this kind of thing and say oh no the reformation caused the enlightenment and all that stuff to which i would say actually there's some evidence that it was the opposite that it was actually the counter-reformation and the hyper skepticism brought about by the jesuits in order to combat protestant uh, interpretations of scripture that was a pretty decent precursor to the Enlightenment. Um, my mate, again, my mate Jeff, a boy for Jesus. He he has access. To, he's he's read more on this stuff, so I could I could probably get some stuff from him and uh, maybe maybe do some content on that or two because it does subvert that narrative to its exact opposite. Um, and, and really briefly, our man Steve Christie here. My wife is from Romania, um, and I think he says uh bistrita the doorway to transylvania I, I presume you might know where that is or <laughs> yeah so bistrita is a city in transylvania my family actually is from transylvania but we're not from bistrita we're from cluj uh, okay. so cluj is the largest city in transylvania and it's not very far it's maybe a couple hours drive from bistrita 
so yeah. I've been to, I've driven through Bistrița before, so it's it's quite nice. It it it's a really nice little town, and it's got a really uh, a really cute you know, sort of downtown center. Uh, you know, so it's it's a really very nice city. And then we have some Romanian gibberish right here. Yeah, the Ubesc means I love you. <laughs> oh, there we go. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. She <laughs> opened in Oh, man. 17th century English reformed patrologist. After rigorously studying the church fathers, I feel more confident in my faith and my place in the broader Catholic tradition of the church. Praise be to God for preserving his bride. Evangelical teenagers who read one letter from Ignatius. He used the word Eucharist and mentioned bishops. Time to become Roman Catholic. <laughs> yeah, this is good. This is also good. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about word association, right? You know, not not oh, reading yeah. carefully, but just finding words on the page and then assuming that he has to that uh, he has to agree was, with other people who use the same words. That whole time in that discussion, I was just thinking of this meme in my head. <laughs> this is the yeah, whole, no, I, like, yeah, I th I think this is good, and I also like the the contrast between these dogs, right? The 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 dog on the left hand side is just this total beast. The one on the right just looks pathetic and weak, like it wouldn't survive in the wild a day. So I, I quite like the the format too. I'll give this one a seven and a half. Nice, nice. <laughs> it's a great one. What if you wanted to go to heaven, but the Pope said that'll be five ninety nine? <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I mean, I don't know how fair it is to you know Roman Catholic purgatorial Not theology, fun. but I think it's funny. It's just it's just a good funny meme. So. This this is also funny too. I I'll give this one I'll give this one seven and a half. I, I consider the accuracy of it seven and a half. That's oh that's great stuff. And yes, as Jono here says, memes with um names. <laughs> yeah yeah. My last name looks like it would be pronounced names. It's actually pronounced Nemesh. Uh, yeah, but so that I, I, everybody I, always thinks that it's pronounced names. So I think I get this segment should be called Memesh with Nemesh. Memesh with Nemesh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that might be good. Uh, okay, I, I don't know if you want to dox yourself, but where from Romania is Dr. Nemesh's family originally from? Yeah, like I said, Cluj, uh, C L U J. That's the name of the city, Cluj. C L U J. Cool. Good to know. Fun fact: facts with facts with Dr. Nemesh about his personal life. How good is that? And and to be fair, with the Roman Catholic thing, the the this obviously isn't totally accurate, but because they would say, or well, at least back then, and even a little bit today, um, everyone who's otherwise saved had to go through time in purgatory, and if you want to cut short that time. You pay for indulgences to forgive your quote unquote venial sins, the temporal punishment of sin, um, and they'll fast track your way to heaven. Basically, the equivalent of microtransactions in most video games today, where you can you can grind to get all the all the gear and the skins and the and the bonuses and loot that you want, but it's a grind. They deliberately make it a grind, and if you just pay a little bit of tr microtransactions, you can get it in an instant, just like that. Yeah. So yeah. I consider the the Church of Rome back in the day and a little bit now today, although they don't really want to emphasize that because they admitted their errors back on back then. Um, but in, in a sense, Roman Catholicism is basically the electronic arts of the Christian world. <laughs> so, yeah. That's my I mean, in my opinion, I just think it's ridiculous that people could think you could control, you have control over how much time a person spends in purgatory. Yeah. I, I think that just the idea is absurd, but you know, yeah. this I mean, is, like, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be one thing if we actually had a statement from Christ himself, where he says, and if you pay the Bishop of Rome a certain amount of money, he can forgive these arbitrarily lesser kinds of sins that for some reason you need to suffer in another dimension for a bit. If, if Jesus said that, that's one thing. Um, he doesn't. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't. It's it's pretty pathetic. The whole distinction of, I mean, the distinction itself of venial and mortal sin, there's validity to it. But when using it for how you somehow stock up temporal punishment for sin that needs to be paid off in purgatory, like why? There's, there's no, when it comes to Christ forgiving our sins and paying the penalty for it all, there's no distinction between mortal and venial sin. That's it. There's nothing about him taking away these general guilt and punishments for general guilt for sin, but then not taking away the temporal punishment for sin. Like what, in what universe does that make sense? I mean, like, whatever, <laughs> whatever. They just need to pay for St. Peter's Basilica. <clears throat> no comment. <laughs> uh, debates in 2021. Capitalism good. No, capitalism bad. Debates in 1595, are women human? The debate of 1595 between Valens Akathelis and Simon Gattacus. So this one is funny, but again, this is like something out of 4chan uh, because it, it you know, it, I think it obviously comes from that sort of like uh, 
abrasively macho and abrasively masculine, sort of like ironically toxically masculine uh, ethos, you know? So I, I, I can see why this is funny, but I, I, I don't really like, um, the, the meme is so closely associated with people that I would otherwise find objectionable and annoying that I don't, I don't really like this one. I don't, I don't feel as good laughing about this one. I can see why it's funny, but at the same time, I'm like, eh, even so, I think this is a well executed meme. So even if I don't find, even if I may have like personal objections to the the sort of people that would produce this, um, I, I do think this is a well executed meme. I will give this six and a half to seven. All right, there you go. That's for so execution. So I don't I don't personally good. like this kind of joke, but I think I think it's it's a well executed meme. It accomplishes its task. So I'll give it I'll give it six and a half to seven for that. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of where we're different because like I, I I love I love these kinds of memes where it's like they take something that's so obviously ridiculous, but they're just so just so blunt about it, just so blunt. <laughs> and, oh, look how chad this is! <laughs> it's just, it's yeah. just absolutely hilarious. Oh man! But uh, next boy, the true church is invisible and consists of all who confess their faith in Christ. That's small brain, bigger brain. Eastern Orthodoxy is the true church with direct ties to the apostles. Bigger brain. The Roman Catholic Church is the true Holy Mother Church by right of the authority of Peter. Ascended brain. Hillsong is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. <laughs> I this, like one's the, a, this one's OC by myself. A long this time one's ago. OC by you. I, I, I like this because the conclusion is so unexpected given the, the buildup. Um, uh, so I, I like this. I think, I think this is good. Um, one problem with memes is that they have to be short and punchy. The longer it takes to read them, the, the, you know, the, the, the quality of the meme goes down. I think this one is sort of straddling the line of being too talky, but it's still good. So I will give you a seven for this one. Well, to be fair, that's kind of, that's kind of the that's kind of a thing with the expanded brain meme. Some of them can be a bit more brief, but others can be a little bit longer. I think that should be should be forgiven for these kind of expanding brain memes. But right, uh, I'll I'm give you right. seven and a half. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the boys hustle hustle for that for that bread. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. It's more OC. We don't worship Mary, bro. Yeah, we pray to her at our own shrines with an entire formula dedicated to her so that she'll protect us and communicate God's divine graces to us while we venerate her as the queen of heaven. But we don't call it Latria, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. I love this format with the guy painting a clown you know, face on himself. I, I think this is really good. And I also, I like the the contrast that you bring out between um, you know, what they say on the one hand and what they do on the other. Uh, so I think also this is a pretty pretty well done meme. I'll give this one a seven and a half. Nice, nice. I'm glad you like this one. It's it, it's it gets in my head so much how adamant they are. We don't worship Mary, and I'm like, okay, cool. You claim not to, but you do literally everything bar offering a living sacrifice to Mary. How is it? <laughs> it's just, and, and that's why I really want to get dedicated, get some dedicated work into it sometime. I have it planned to go into the biblical definition of what it means to serve a God. And that's what it means to serve Yahweh and serve other gods. What mm -hmm. is the extent of the first and second commandment? What does he mean by not serving other gods? Is that only exclusively specifically referring to offering a living sacrifice and nothing else? Cause that's what Roman Catholics will say in response, um, which thus means that I could have a statue of Baal, bow down to it, pray to him, call him the King of the sky, um, ask for his intercession, ask for his powers. But as long as I don't offer a living sacrifice, I'm not, I'm not violating the first and second commandment. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, I think that's crazy. Um, and, and I think basically the, I think you're right that um, the cult of the saints in Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, whatever like the theoretical justification of it might be, in practice, it seems to me to... Um, to be incompatible with the kind of uh, Christocentrism that I think apostolic preaching calls for. Uh, yeah, so, right. you know, the theoretical justification of it is one thing, how it actually forms your mind and your heart and the sort of person it turns you into, I think that's something else. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I, I, I would I would tend to agree with you here. It does. I you know, I even see in my own circles, I won't name names, but the amount of Marian devotion, even by Catholic standards, just becomes absolutely ridiculous. In especially with respect to the imbalance between that and the and and God Himself, especially with like the 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 Rosary itself being like the central prayer of Roman Catholic life, um, the most long, the longest, most detailed, most like impactful, and all that. And that's dedicated to Mary, not to Christ. I mean, they have they have little bits in it that are towards Christ and the Father, but 
that's not really the focus, unfortunately. Um, right. how, how many lay do you give this boy? I give this one a seven and a half. Nice. So many sevens and seven and a half far out. Okay. I told you I'm strict. You got to really, know, know. you got to really me. impress me. Now I've got a couple more, and their video and their videos, and they're both OC. So here's right. our here's our first one. How do you write that? So. I know I like this one because you chose the the guy who sings, you know, along to Ozone, and that's the Romanian band. Uh, I also like the basically this guy's just having a grand old time with his Bible reading and believing and so on, and the Catholic has to do all this work in order accidentally not to fall into heresy. I think this is good. Um, one point of critique: I, I. I would like the music, but with a different video. So like maybe just a video or like an image of people just reading their Bibles and having a good time, you know, so the, <laughs> to bring out the contrast, cause this guy, he's having a good time, but it's not as closely connected to the Bible. It's not, it's not like explicitly connected to his interaction with the Bible. So that might be a point of improvement, but I think this is really good. And I also appreciate the shout out to Romanian culture in, implicit oh, yeah. in it. So once more, I'll give you a seven and a half. Sweet. Hey, as, as we said before, this is a peer reviewed memes. I love the critique. I'm going to put up this one, but I probably will also make that other version of just people in a Bible study. That sounds with the music. That that sounds pretty rad. That does sound pretty rad. <laughs> and one more, one more piece of OC. <laughs> on how do you how, what do you think I of that <laughs> <laughs> i like these memes with like the orthodox chant in the background and just stuff from contemporary times happening in the video i really think that's funny i like the cutout of uh you know saint nicholas's head um instead of some area and i think i would have said arius there um because <laughs> the story goes that he hit arius uh strictly well I, 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 the reason why i didn't do that is because the earliest sources on that say it was just an arian that he punched. Oh, really? Um, okay. Some, a later source eventually says Arius himself, but the earliest ones say um, uh, some Arian, although I think even those earliest sources are a bit late, but either way. So I, I decided to be a little bit historically nitpicky with this. Okay. One. So I'll, I will give you, I'll give you an extra point for that one. Uh, in that case, uh, I really think it's hilarious that he's just some guy in an arcade and he's, you know, punching the hell out of that thing as hard as he can. So I, I think, I think it's really funny. And the, you know, the St. Nicholas head, just immobile, just following his body around and looking straight forward with this mean look on his face. Like, don't mess with me. I think this is really good. This is very well done. The background music is ominous enough that it, it gives the whole, you know, it gives it like a whole feeling of like a holy beat down. I will give you a <laughs> for this. This is very good. An eight? An eight. Woo! Yes, that's awesome. Now, fun fact, some fun lore about this meme. This is me in the video. That's you in the video. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nice. So Very I, good. I had the arcade with my mates some far out, like a year or so ago. Um, and I just getting, I was one of them record on my phone, like with the slow-mo feature, just a mad punch. And it was, oof, it was something good. Um, but then very shortly after I had this exact idea, decided to make it. And uh, unfortunately you can't see my, you can, you can kind of partially see my beard poke out uh, my glorious uh, <laughs> Mediterranean facial hair um maybe around the start ish yeah you can see that little black yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice but yes this is me this is the this is a, no this this is this is really life. good i think this is your best work that you've shown <laughs> yes. me best for last thank you very much for that and uh with that i think that concludes our part one of today um everybody thank you so much for coming along to this this was an absolutely excellent stream and if you please, if you aren't already please do subscribe to this channel and follow my various social media including my alternative accounts like on gab and on odyssey and bitshoot just in case the 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 zuck or in this case the uh whoever runs youtube decides to nuke me because i'm giving a little bit too much christianity at once um and if you believe in my ministry if you want to support me um and get some nice little bonuses along the way you can become a patron and the link is down that down below in the description for all of that and uh dr nemesh Thank you so much for coming along. Today was flipping awesome. I, I really hope you enjoyed it yourself. I did very much. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow's discussion. I think it'll be even better.
Sweet. Perfect. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Dr. Stephen Nemish, and this has been The Other Paul. Thank you very much for coming along and joining us. I hope you have a blessed day and or evening. God bless everybody. See you later. See you tomorrow.